Initializing Faker. Retrograde Amnesia is a member of the Greenlit Podcast Network. To find the other excellent shows on the network, please go to greenlitpodcasts.com. If you enjoy listening to this podcast and want to hear more of it, please consider supporting us at patreon.com slash retroam. Patrons get early access, bonus episodes, and access to all of our miniseries episodes, covering other JRPGs like Terranigma and Parasite Eve. Please visit us at patreon.com slash retroam. Hey Eric. Hey Chris. Is this the last one? I think so. For season two, closing it out. Okay, we're closing it out. How do you feel about this? We already beat Chrono Cross. What are we going to do now? Listen to Mark Shepard's music. Uh, okay. Do you want to hear some hot sounds that I recorded? Yes. Okay. Welcome to Retrograde Amnesia, a comprehensive podcast where we discuss classic JRPGs, chapter by chapter, beat by beat. This is our Chrono Cross series. In this episode, we save our game and access the many routes that our lives could have taken, and wonder what kind of cool friends we could have made if we didn't know our current uncool friends. My name is Chris. I'm joined tonight by Eric. Hey, Eric. What's up, Chris? How many hey. friends you got? Give, uh, give me a number. In real life? Yeah. Oh, I don't know. Like the... I've got 17. Beat that. I would say 12 to 17. That's maybe cool. somewhere in, the, yeah. in that range. Healthy adult. Yeah. We are also joined tonight by The Real Net, a collective of patrons who are listening to us record live. You too can join us at patreon.com slash retro AM. We are also joined by The Fake Net, who, as the concept of infinity, has no beginning and no end and is not a part of Chrono Cross. Initializing Fake Net. I'm in heaven. There's no beginning and there is no end. Feels like I'm dreaming, but I'm not sleeping. It's just a sweet, sweet fantasy baby. Congratulations, FakeNet. Hello. FakeNet, will you be returning for our next season? Are you going to send some other schmo to do this work? What the hell are you talking about? Of course, there is no one else. Well, no, we know it's always you, but what voice are you going to use this time? The only voice that I have, Eric. I am still alive. Don't forget about... There is no one else. Got it. Oh, the other one's not you. My bad. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to associate. It's fine. That is a question I've had for a while. Are there two fake nets? Not anymore. I'm taking a smoke break. Please, God, someone help me. Is this yes. an id situation? Okay. Yes, if I can step outside of the, uh, the the podcast bubble, the current fake net does not know about the old fake net and is alarmed whenever the other one makes a presence. Okay, I thought so, but I just want to double check. So, Eric, at the end of Chrono Cross, you get the option to save your game. This game sort of piggybacks on the legacy of Chrono Trigger in the New Game Plus department. This is one of the... One of the earliest games to do it, aside from Chrono Trigger, do you have any other, can you think of any other New Game Plus things off the top of your head besides Chrono Trigger? Parasite Eve. Oh, wow, congrats. We're doing a mini series on that. It's probably pr- pretty good. It's called EX mode. It's not quite the same thing. Oh, but okay. This game had to do it because of the legacy of Chrono Trigger. Yeah, you're think, beholden to your ancestors. If you're working with time travel or parallel dimensions, it fits in quite nicely for the alternate ending stuff. So tonight we are going to talk about all of the alternate endings As long as it takes. Well, there's also a format here. A bunch of stuff carries over, although not key items and not, I think, summons you lose, summon elements, and then stuff like the Master Immune you don't take with you. Yeah. But you do have the Time Egg, which allows you to go and beat the game at different times with different plot implications. Doing this will lead to a different series of endings, depending on when you choose to do this. Doing this on your own is not worth the experimentation. And it, you were, it, even back then, you had to look up when and where to go yeah. do this stuff, unless you had all the time in the world, which, right. hey, many kids did. But something that's kind of separate from that, you know what, you, do you know what else you got in New Game Plus mode that was in no other game before? No? A fast forward button. Really? That made you run at like 2X or 3X speed. Shit, they added to the Final Fantasy releases when they came back out on modern platforms. Wow. Finally, they took something from Chrono Cross. Yeah. <laughs> you know, they wouldn't take the battle system or any of this other stuff, but uh, hey. Because, you know, you're you're... The early parts of the game, you got to kind of coast through, right? It cuts down on the annoyance. Like, again, Chrono Cross, as its theme, is a very efficient and streamlined experience. End of generation title. Yes. The first ending isn't really part of this. It is the bad ending if you just kill Time Devourer without playing your musical notes. Yeah, uh, this is probably the ending that most people experience the first time they play this game. I want to say I I almost, I would have gotten it because I had no memory of doing it the previous time despite being friends with you jerk-offs. Like, I'm pretty sure no one told me about doing the ending properly. Yeah, this happened to me and I was like, oh, wow, this is not good. I am going to go play Diablo 2 now. Bye. 
because, and I don't think I found out about the other ending until a couple of weeks later. I don't think that there was enough internet proliferation at that point in time. The discourse is not as strong as it currently is. No, of course not. But when you do that, the time devourer starts to explode and it shoots a column of purple light into the sky. The clouds swirl and it absorbs the time devourer with Shala. Yeah. Gone, done, adios. There's, yeah, this, is, this was kind of hinted at during the game. I think it was maybe Balthazar talked about how you can't kill it. It's always just going to recede back into this uh, dimension in between time, and then she will be trapped there for forever. So that's what we're doing. We're basically just delaying the inevitable of, of time being eaten. Yeah, but like many of our boomer ancestors, you just push the pollution problem off to an era where you'll be dead and won't have to worry about it anymore, and someone else can deal with it because I've done my part. That's true. Right? <laughs> yes. But when you do this, you don't get anything else in the like any of the follow-up epilogue you did in the proper game, but you do get the credits and then the FMV scenes. Yes. Where Kid is in real life searching for you, the player. But that doesn't make any sense, given the bad ending, right? Yeah, no. No, no it doesn't. Why not? They should not have shown that. They should have just shown scenes from the game and not shown that. That would have been You want them to do way. two separate credits? Credits, I bet, are the last thing you do. No way they're doing that twice. Okay, well, sorry. So next, canonically, when you look up all the guides, it's the programmer's ending, but Chris made the executive decision to say, hey, that sounds like the last thing we should be doing. Yeah. So it will be the last thing we'll be doing in this uh, LP, this long pod. Long pod. <laughs> Did you just come up with that? Yeah. Congratulations. Better. So the first ending that, we, uh, that, that we're going to tackle here is called General Kid. General Kid. General Kid. General Kid. Just a general kid. Just when, when do you get kid. this? What do you have to do to get this ending? When do you use the time egg to do this ending? So before you break into Viper Manor, you can do it after you've crossed the dimension. So basically after you've been lost at Opossa Beach and, and arrived in Otherworld, you can then initiate the time egg sequence and then murder the time devourer. As long as I can take Pierre with me. You will not have... Well, I guess you will have Pierre. You, you could, if, yeah, as long as you don't enter Viper Manor, yeah, right? But you could you could technically do this like with just Surge and Postule or something like that. So either way works. So you beat that time devourer and then it takes you to Arnie another world yes Serge rolls up to the dock in that guy's boat the guy that took us to water dragon isle yeah lena has her hands on her hips she's next to kiki and pashul is lying down next to the sleepy fisherman he's laying down next to the sleepy fisherman i thought pashul was fishing itself i don't think pashul can fish well no opposable thumbs you gotta hold a pole my head can't well you could always just tie it to it and say hey pashul watch this you want to put you want to put a fishing pole on a dog's collar no just attach it to the dock I mean, I, oh, the dock. I, like I don't one of those holders put... you put poles at. Well, then Pashul couldn't reel it. Even if, if it's a cane pole. Chris, you ever been fishing? No. Are yeah. you serious? No, I've never, you never been, been fishing. fishing. No, I don't know. We're in Kentucky. How the fuck is that possible? I, I, I'm one of the few people who don't have, uh, who doesn't have an outdoorsman family. Wow. Yeah. yeah. So uh, I've been to a boat before. I've been to a dock. Uh -huh. And I would not leave Pashul in charge of my fishing responsibilities if, if I had Pashul there. But I thought Pashul was fishing. That's weirder than our other friend Chris not swimming. Yeah. Jesus. Yeah? Do I need in, a minute, man. Doing it in the podcast? Yeah. All right, let me play the sleep music. So when Serge comes back, the uh, since Serge cannot do it himself, his uh, fisherman buddy is bragging on Serge's behalf. Mm -hmm. He says, motherfucker almost caught a 10-foot lion shark. Yes. This is before Lena calls Serge honey. Yes, of course. This is this is the sweet ending, I guess. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, Lena like can't believe Serge has been a housekeeper, like used to be a housekeeper. The fisherman says he's been fishing all his life because he's trapped in a video game and forever a fisherman. <laughs> yes. He doesn't say that. Anyway, he's never seen anyone as talented as Serge, the great apprentice. And then Lena gives, and the fisherman gives Serge a perfect 10. But as this is happening, you just see Kid kind of like comically inching her way down that dock. Yeah, she eventually it's pretty starts, funny. She eventually starts tapping her foot. It's pretty yeah, good. Yeah. Like Sonic the Hedgehog. I didn't notice it the first time until the dialogue, until it cut to her, her dialogue really quick. Because I think some white text appears on top of the screen. Yeah. She's like, I can't do much with you. They keep talking to Serge and about how he'll be all set to marry Lena since he's going to be so good at fishing. And the fisherman says, you go girl, to Lena at some point. After the you go girl, kid walks away. Yeah. Once that's delivered, that's it. Yeah, we're done. Kiki tells Lena she's blushing. The whole thing is saccharine and weird. Serge looks around, asking if anyone heard anything. And everyone's like, nah, man, you're just tired. Lena then says something about Serge needing protein. She blushes some more, then it fades to black. Hmm. So this is like the aw shucks, happy days, Andy Griffith, like, harmonious small town boy never leaves small town ending becomes fisherman yeah and you if you think about it from the perspective of what was going on in this game when the time devourer was yeah. killed kid was in the process of looking for surge who had crossed the dimension so she could join up with him because she was kind of programmed to do that yeah and 
he didn't show up on Cape Howl like maybe she thought she, he would because of, you know, whatever the fucking destiny shit that we talked about in the previous episode. So she came looking for him and then just noticed that he was just not having he was, that adventure. He was lost. Life. Yeah, yeah, he's not having that He adventure. took one more fishing trip and that was it. <laughs> yeah, it was done with. So did sending time to Val or back, did that break kids programming I as think so. like a bond from Shala? Like it severed that link and she was like, she lost her primary objective and just wandered off into the forest? I'm not necessarily sure that it broke her bond with it, but it, she, cause I think she was anticipating joining up with Serge because she was programmed kind of to do so. Mm-hmm. And now that I guess this is all fucked up, she's going to go take matters into her own hand. You know what bonds they broke, Chris? The bonds of fate. What is kid's element? Fire. What is Serge's? Pretend it's blue. Cause he's a fisherman now bonds of sea and fire. Oh, bo- <laughs> thanks Eric. It's not blue. It didn't work. The thing didn't work. I didn't think about that until I was halfway done thinking it, Chris. I'm glad you said it. Xenogears so, Pod. Yes. Check it out. Season Coming one. in the past. So, season one. Go back there and download that. So that's all we get. Then where do we go next? Uh, we are cutting to Viper Manor. Uh, Snakebone Mansion place. Yes, Snakebone Mansion. We're here and we're in like the last screen where we're in the hallway with Riddell's room and Viper's office yeah. and the uh, the cutoff to the terrace area. Before the showdown. Yes. Kid is on that top floor. She stops and looks around, then runs into Viper's office. I got you now, Link's text appears after she enters the door. So at this point, I thought, oh, good. Finally, we'll see what is behind that door in Viper's office where Viper like mysteriously emerged from or Link's emerged from. I was like, finally, there can be like some art back here we can go see. Oh, we, we did go in that office. We went in the office. We didn't go behind. Oh, behind the, the, the bookcase. There's like a door back yeah, there. Yeah, yeah, right. But as you'll come to learn, all these endings, most of them are just asset rearrangements. There's not quite a lot of new stuff in here. Yeah. So then she asks if the object in the office is the frozen flame. Lynx then asks if Kid is one of the radical dreamers. Kid tells him to shut up, and then, in the name of Luca, Lynx interrupts to ask what she's talking about, and then knife slashing noises. Yeah, it suggests Lynx is getting owned. Yes, it's an off-screen battle. It's not very climatic. And also, like, with with Surge messing up the timeline by killing the Time Devourer early, did that make kids stronger and more... Inc- like, is, are, is the implication here that Surge and, and Guile or, or Nikki f- fucked this up and Kid could have handled this herself better? Or is this well, just for laughs? It may be just for laughs, but now that she mentioned our objective, like, Link severed to Time Devourer, she probably resorted to, like, Objective B, yeah. which tried to do it without Surge. So she went for the Frozen Flame, which I guess was still there at that point, right? When she emerges, she's holding what she says is the frozen flame, but it's the dragon tear. Oh, okay. So maybe she's getting poorly informed. Yeah, she's she's poorly informed. Or maybe we we never got into the Riddell hostage situation because yeah. maybe she got here a lot quicker than Surge and friends w- would have. Kid then stops and doubles over, laughing. The object glows, and Kid notes that she has killed two birds with one stone. And something amazing happens. Kid rides the elevator down as the dragoon starts to play. Yes. Who's at the bottom? It's all of the dragoons, all of the devas, and way too many character models of generic soldiers. It's twenty on the dragoons plus all three devas. <laughs> yes. Karsh introduces us to the new Lord of El Nido, General Kid. Kid says "Oi," then taps her foot and introduces herself as the new Lord of El Nido. What Karsh just said. Yes, thanks, Karsh. Kid laughs maniacally, but then a dragoon rushes up from the back of the room. He says, "The poor army is headed this way." Zoa screams. Chrono Cross drops to five frames per second. <laughs> yeah. Dragoon starts scrambling around the room. Kid yells for them to calm down, slow your goddamn roll, and they all stop and face her. She reminds them that they have the frozen flame, and there's nothing to worry about with Kid in charge. But she doesn't have the frozen flame, right? Yeah, she doesn't. So, actually, when she builds the the, the dragoons back up to this great nation, city-state, or whatever she does... She's not doing it with the power of the frozen flame. She's doing it with the power within. It's all about the power of your mind and charisma, Chris. Yes, thank you. It goes a long way. It's a great message. You too can colonize and commit genocide if you just have it deep inside you, I guess. Did you notice when Kid springs into action, she jumps over a dragoon and owns one of of their faces? Like the Mm -hmm. guy, the the messenger boy that ran in to tell him that the poor army was tacking. Yeah. She jumps over and kicks him over and commands the troops to well to karsh scramble. calms before that karsh calms down the frames per second disaster and tells him to line back up and yeah. then the dream that time dreams plays which we haven't heard since the intro yeah it is like the intro montage music yeah and kid says they're going to defeat the kingdom of guardia right after they put these poor blokes in their place and then you're right kid leaps over the devas and jumps on the messenger then runs out the mansion 
Everybody falls in line and also stampedes over the guy on the floor who, as far as I can tell, did nothing wrong. Is that like a symbol of like her, mega, her like newfound mega- megalomania where she's just yeah. like running over the peons yes. to achieve victory? Yes. She's become a conquistador. Conquista kid. Conquista kid. Conquista kid. Yeah, thanks. Kiss the kid. Then the screen fades to black and we get some narration of what happened later. It says, later, the Acacia Dragoons, led by General Kidd, went on to conquer the neighboring countries with ease. It was the birth of a new sovereign nation, the Acacia Empire. And standing next to General Kidd's throne was the Frozen Flame. The end. Game over. Mm. Thanks. That's Dean. it. My opinion, it would have been more on brand for a kid to make that speech than leave, leaving the dragoons thinking she was serious when she was clearly fucking with them. Yeah, that would have been way better. That would have been more in line with her character, but nonetheless, we got that. What do you give that ending, Chris? You can rate in letter or numerical value, or in the terms of number of bananas you would eat to never see it again. Um, I'm going to go with the... Uh, I'm going to go. With, I'm gonna give it a Metacritic score. Okay. I'm going to give it a 68. That's a yellow. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's in the yellow for me. It's fine. I'd give it a yellow as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Next ending, Eric. A true hero. Yes, there a are real two, human being. Yes, there are true. There are true. There are two versions of this ending. One if you have kid with you, and one if you did not save kid. Right. Yes. The true hero without kid. Let's go with this one. Okay. This thanks, one, Chris. You're welcome, buddy. Anytime. This one can be unlocked while kid is incapacitated after the Viper Manor break in. So poisoned. Yes, poisoned and knocked into the uh, Doc's uh, house hut of hospitals and the, house's hut of hospitals yes thanks take me to the triple h <laughs> are you ready and the version of this ending that you get is dependent upon the choice that you made on whether or not to save her or not so we're going to go with the without kid sequence and it starts off with serge working in termina at lisa's element shop yes her father not fun guy comes from the back door and says it looks like serge is getting used to working here Optimism plays as Lisa tells Daddy, don't tell me you're going out to gather mushrooms again. He says now that Serge is helping out, he has a lot more free time. Lisa yells at her father about doing inventory, and he's like, don't worry, at my age, you gotta live a little. So, as of right now, I'm assuming this happened whether Serge was here or not, and my guy was going to go make up whatever excuse he needed to go do mushrooms in the haunted woods. Yeah, I mean, that's what he does. We, 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 we know his other self. I, I think this fun guy is not our fun guy, maybe. I could be wrong. Either way, the, the dude's got a shroom addiction that he needs to get a hold of before he loses his family. Yes, absolutely. And found a new family like many people with drug addictions. Yes. Lena then comes in, right? Well, he laughs as he tells Serge and Lisa they make a great couple and how he's glad he doesn't have to worry about that shit anymore. Lisa covers her face and tells her father she hates it when he jumps to conclusions like that. Father then says he's going to shadow for us and Lisa's like, all right, be careful. Yeah. So Lisa gets the business and the camera pans over and get, who walks in? It's Lena. She comes in. She's angry. Oh, she's got some shit to say. Serge and Lisa are just chatting away, and Lena's like, excuse me, you have a customer. And I imagine her doing, like, a, a really rehearsed head bob. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Lisa's like, shit, sorry, I didn't realize you were there. Lena wonders, what's so good about Termina anyway? And a lot of small town hicks, like you and myself, when we yes. go to the big city, we're like, what's the big deal? Right. Tokyo is only trains. Then, under her breath, she wonders, Lena wonders why Serge decided to work here when he already found him a good job in Arnie. You know, the fisherman. Yeah. My boy had eyes for Lisa and left Lena in the fucking dust, man. Yeah. That's what I think is happening here. Yeah, I think you're right. He visits the city once, gets the pretty girl who's your friend's friend, and just decides to start working for her dad. Yeah, that's what happens in real life all the time. What's next is amazing. Lisa, and I'm not making this up, says, did you say something, Lena? I can't hear you. <laughs> what happened to your loud, annoying voice? <laughs> Lena takes some steps forward, hands behind her back, and says, capital letters, oh my... I think this element may be rotten. She's not talking about an element. Oh, she's talking about a lowercase element. Yes. Okay, good. She asked Lisa if this kind of merchandise, if this is the kind of merchandise Lisa sells to customers. Lisa says, speaking of rotten, there is an awful stink when Lena walked in. Mm. Lena then counters back, saying she's pretty sure the smell is coming from this shop, coming from Lisa's rotten personality. Ooh, it's actually from Fun Guy's Mushrooms. Yes, that's right. They're, he's been hoarding them and they're stinking, but they're inoculated. Lisa tells Lena, isn't it time you went home alone? All by yourself. No one to walk you home. Goddamn, Chris. This is some harsh shit. Yeah. Lena screams, turns around and holds a fist in the air and says, ah, why does it have to turn out like this? The camera then pans up and the scene fades to black. 
So it's subtext here, but this utterly fails the Betchel test because they're talking about Surge's companionship the yeah. entire time. <laughs> yeah, it does. Like there's no agency beyond who has possession of Surge here. Yeah, that's true. Which and, that's kind of upsetting, but... And it's even worse because Surge can't say shit. Yeah. <laughs> He can't mediate. He can't assert himself. He can't say, hey, Lena, but yeah. they're both in love with a mute. Yeah. Which weird. is fine. Mutes need love. Next scene, we see Kid. She's working in the Viper Manor kitchens. Yes. With the with the chef, with the spy guy. Orch is there. Sh- yeah. The spy guy's there and Orch is chopping shit up. Yeah. He's still chopping shit up at uh, seven frames per second. Uh, this uh, confirms now that the, that the uh, cook in the kitchen is actually Norris the spy. Yeah. Because it's Norris with a portrait here she's washing dishes and norris says she tells bloody rose to stop complaining a spy must conduct investigations as the music optimism once again starts yes kids like when did i become a spy and quit it with that code name shit norris turns around and rubs his own back and he's like you don't like it how about what chris red scorpion fuck yeah kid says this isn't the bloody point yes orchard then tells the newbies not to slack off kid is like fine i'll do it you did save my life for getting me that Hydra humor. Yes. This is what happens if you never rescue her, I guess. It is. that That is the generally accepted canon that if Kid, if you choose not to rescue Kid, Norris hears about it, gets on his boat back to the mainland and mm-hmm. brings Hydra humor because he feels bad. Well, that I just assume like maybe Hydra humor is over in poor. Just like, oh no, we got like a hundred of those on the boat. We use it actually yeah. in our soup. So yeah. uh, do you want, do you want one? It, this cures you? Fine. Yeah. Um, that, that could be the case. I didn't know if she was fate. talking. Fate. 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 Anyway, she's fine. Now, where the hell? She says uh, she's fine. Now, where the hell did Surge and them go? The scene then fades to black. Yes. We are now in Fort Dragonia. This is part three. Yes, part three. We are heading to Fort Dragonia. The doors open just like they do in the cold open of the video game. I was not ready for what happens no, next. No, I was not ready. Who steps Either. out of the elevator? Salt, Pepor, and Pierre. Edge of death place. Yes, of course it does. <laughs> Just like, they, of course, that is the perfect combo, man. That yes. is who he belongs with. Yes, they are. They are the stand-ins for Surge, who never completed his quest, and Kid, who didn't know where the fuck to go. Salt and Pepper get out of the elevator. Who doesn't? Pierre doesn't get out of there because he's got to take a huge shit. <laughs> That's not exactly how he phrases it, but it's true. There's no turning back now. Pepper tells Pierre to shake it. Pepper says, just you wait, Lynx. We'll teach you a lesson about General Viper's spice. I mean, spite. Shake it and say your prayers. Not that it'll do you any good. And then they tell Pierre, like, you've got to be on your way. And Pierre's like, actually, Moi seemed to have an upset stomach from last night's party at yep. Monsieur. Monsieur? Monsieur. Mr. French. M- Monsieur. Monsieur. Ma- sorry. I'm sorry, Cadmoni. French fake net. Création de faux filet. C'est prononcé, monsieur. It is not a good idea for Moi to run. So, Chris, is he faking because of cowardice, uh, less likely, or because he thinks Salt and Pepor are even worse equipped than he is to deal with his operation? Oh, no. Pierre's a big, de- big time dumbass coward. I know, but are they even like poorer than he is and he's sensing they have no choice i don't think so okay. because the thing about salt and the poor they are always 100 percent committed to what they're doing that's true you know what they're I mean? earnest yes salt's like are you serious about being a hero and then pepora calls pierre pathetic pathetic pierre slowly exits the elevator and strolls past the spice boys salt and pepora run off toward the next screen pierre slowly takes a few steps and begs them not to run which when i have diarrhea you're it's one of the worst feelings that humans can yeah. like have without like someone shooting you. Yeah, it's right? the. Uh, I mean, you, you've seen the Lamar Jackson run, right? Yes. Yeah, uh-huh. yeah. I've that. played "Don't Shit Your Pants." <laughs> yeah, yeah. It cuts to the elevator. The music stops. The Spice Boys and Pierre land at the top. Salt wonders what in the hell just happened. They had no idea it was a laser elevator. They have no idea where they are. Nope. Pepor looks over the edge. He says they're so high up. He wonders if they're floating. Salt notes their bodies passed through the floor. And he's like, wow, Pierre, this sure is some fort, huh? Pepper asks Pierre what's shaken because he doesn't look so well. Who knows if there will be a toilet up ahead? (laughs) Just shake it and hold it. If they would listen to this podcast, they would know how many toilets are. Where all the toilets are. Yes. Pierre nods his head. He says he's a hero. He'll do fine. He'll do his best, actually. Yes. Pepper notes that they shook out a lot of cash to hire him, and he better. The three then approach the double set of doors. Salt says someone should open them. He leaves it to Pepper. Pierre suggests they solve this with a game of rock, paper, scissors. They do this with three, with three people somehow, and what happens? Pierre loses. He loses the goddamn game. Yes, he complains that he wants a rematch. But then what does he start feeling? Uh, poopy? The squirts. The squirts. Is that what he says? He says the squirts. Oh, God, I didn't notice that. Very graphic description. Wow, That's why I, it's rated T, Chris. Yeah. 
and then passes out and rolls on the ground, complaining about the pain. Buddy, I've been there. Question. Two hours ago. What's up? Are Pierre's pants now a toilet? Hmm. He's just shitting them. It's got to be. Okay. <laughs> Increase it. Crank it. Crank it up. The Chrono Cross Toilet. No, you don't. No, absolutely not. Toilets are defined by their communal utility. There is no way someone would let you borrow their pants just so you could shit in him. Or that you would put on the pants and shit in the pants someone just shat in. Sorry, boys. Salt suggests they shake another game. Pierre gets up and agrees. Before they can, the camera pans up and fades to black. Yeah. White text. Pierre has died. Nope. No. <laughs> That's not what it says. He, he shit himself to death, just like Rush Limbaugh. Yes. 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 Yeah, could carry on. What's it actually say? Shit himself to death like, oh no. Uh, <laughs> it says the three of them were never heard from again. Wow. LOL, that's it. <laughs> Great. That was, uh, that was terrific. Uh, you, my, my favorite implication here of this entire ending is that these three beat son of a gun. Yeah, right. <laughs> Somehow, like through idiocy or cowardice or like. Yes. Pepor got a big old kissy wissy. They fed him some Motrin. Yeah. Not Motrin. What's the diet? Mo. Uh, what's. God damn it. Mo. A fake net. What's the diarrhea medicine I take when I drive? Initializing fake net. When you drive. Why? It's Imodium. Imodium. That's it. Oh, great. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> that's anti diarrhea medicine. Not Whatever. <laughs> <laughs> take them both. See what happens. <laughs> okay. Hang in there. This same ending also has an alternate ending with Korcha, right? So instead of Kid working in Viper Manor, she is one of the people who enters the element shop after Lena has left and been cursed out and told to leave. Right. Uh, I think there was some dialogue here about a about Lisa calling Lena ugly for not qualifying for a beauty pageant. So I think the dialogue might be a little bit different. It's cool. a little weird. Still some bickering. Yeah, exactly. And then Korcha enters. He's attempting to renew his wedding vows with Kid. Like, cause remember he said he... He, he, yeah, he was yeah. sweet on her. That's right. That yeah. boat conversation. Yeah. So he gets down on his hands and knees and ki and he's like trying to have this sentimental moment. So you know how like in this happens in a lot of a lot of media where like the character will turn around and, and face away from the people and having this wistful moment uh -huh. where he's he's divulging all of his feelings. Yes. To uh, to kid. At some point, kids like fuck it, and she just leaves. Yeah, and then Macha walks in. Uh oh, so Korcha then turns around and proposes to his mom. Proposes to his mom. Proposes to his mom. And we finally have our mother wife moment in this game. Yes, the edible complex yes, shines finally. And then Macha just talks mad shit. Uh, she mentions that he should not be doing that because he hasn't even hit puberty yet. It's pretty funny. Yeah. Also, I mean, when you wear a small loincloth, getting an erection is tough to deal with. Yes, absolutely. Then the, the ending plays out the same with Salt Papour and Pierre. Okay. No difference there. SPP. So, yes, SPP. I'm down with it. So ends ending five. Yes, I Slash 5.5. Sure. I don't have a n numerical order here. I'll give that one a yellow plus. Yeah. Like it was a, actually, you know what? I'll give that a green. The Salt and Papour and Pierre thing's fucking great. Yeah, that's a mid green, right? Yeah. Okay. 8.5. Thanks. Ending six, The Magical Dreamers. Yes. This one can be unlocked before going to Fort Dragonia. The first time. Yes. And Nikki must be in the party, and you also have to have acquired our friend, Razley. So this is something I actually could have done in my, well, not in my initial playthrough, but, you right. know, I had them the first yes. time. Yes. You also must have rescued Kid as well. So there's a lot of different parameters for this particular one. So we start off again in Lisa's shop. Termina plays. Lena runs in and is like, come on, Lisa, what are you doing? They won't be able to get the good seats unless they leave right now. Lisa walks back and forth, then eventually concludes she must have misplaced the tickets. Oh, no, you're not going to see in sync. Lena can't believe this shit. No. She wants Lisa to hurry and thinks they'll have to stand in the back at this rate. Chris, at concerts, I prefer to be in the back. Yeah. I don't want to be up front yeah. talking to people. After that, Lena turns around and says, but I never knew she was so talented. Nikki was almost begging her to join. Lisa is also amazed that Nikki picked her. Lisa wonders why Nikki didn't pick Lisa. And Lena responds, my, my, don't we have an ego? Yeah. So it's not clear who the fuck they're talking about no. right now. Lisa eventually finds the tickets, but doesn't tell Lena that they were in her pocket the entire time. My father has also done this. Ah. Both Lena and Lisa leave. Then Lisa's dad, in human form, comes out of the back. He looks around confused, thinking he just heard some yelling in here. There's a lot of hustle and bustle outside, and he wonders if something is going on today because he's been doing mushrooms. Then we're in Termina. We're yes. outside. It's bustling with crowd noise. Every NPC is here. Yes. Multiple times, their, I think. Yes. All in their colorful glory. All Cop the clones. Copy-paste. Yes. 
They're standing outside in the center of the first screen. It's revealed they're in line for the show. Chrono Cross cuts over to the east screen by the Magical Dreamer's ship, revealing the remainder of the line. Maybe it's not a line. Maybe they're just watching from where they are. And there is no formal seating available. Yeah, why do you need to have a ticket to stand in the middle of the street? I can definitely see a megal- like a mayor evicting people from the street to sell tickets oh, to like a public location, right? Yeah, like, like Waterfront Park, they do that in Louisville all the time. Yeah, like when they round up all the homeless people and get them out of the way yeah, when the dirty like, comes. Yeah, yeah mm-hmm. it's and fucking terrible. Make yeah. the city appear to be better than it actually is. Yeah. We live in a toilet. Please come see it. Yeah. Churchill Downs. <laughs> they would move it if they could, folks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all right. There is no formal seating available. What a fucked system. Anyway, a voice appears and says the show is about to start. Yes. It cuts to a black background on the SS Invincible. Yes, this is the same stage that Nikki performed his Magical Dreamer song in, yes. in, in the main game. They reuse assets. I don't know if it's supposed to be the same stage or if it's just boat. Yeah, that was all kind of abstract to begin with, so it's hard to say. So Nikki, me, you, and me are out front. This looks like the same set dressing as the Marbule concert. Yep. Nikki says, to all you rockers out there in Termina... Many thanks for coming out to see our gig. I hope you're all having a great time at the Viper Festival. At this time, I'd like to introduce some of our new band members. He introduces Serge on percussion. Yes. Serge walks out of that black background, bows, and stands next to the big drum. His bow is very elaborate, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. It almost feels like... We had to have seen it somewhere else because there's nothing new here ever. But yeah. Kid is on vocals, and Kid runs up to the tip of the ship's mast and says, Oi, everyone, I'm the new vocalist for the Magical Dreamers. Kid's me name. You guys ready to rock? Yeah. Chris is ready to rock. I can tell him. I'm, I'm, Look I at can. your fucking face, yeah. dude. Yeah. He also introduces Razley as their new mascot. Eric, question. Yeah, what's up? Is this a Cleveland Indian situation here? Like, oh, no. The fairy is the mascot? Yeah. Because yeah. it's a real-life fairy that yeah. they've captured after yeah, the genocide? Yeah, it's kind of fucked up. Like, Razzly seems think about to be that. willing it, but willing, Dude. but, uh, yeah. It's not. I was like, oh, they found a way to get Razzly in one of the endings. Yeah. Razzly is like one of those no. underserved characters you should never hear from again. No. No, it's not good. It's like Shepard parading the Prothean around. Like, dude, fucking yeah. don't make him fight. Just part of the, this ending implies that the humans eventually enslave the fairies, maybe the dwarves too, probably. No, I think they still murder the dwarves. Okay, good. I mean, not good, but yes. Christ. Anyway, yes. Razley flies down, yes. waves, and says hi to everyone. Nikki then says, with our new powerful lineup. <laughs> I love that line, powerful lineup. It's our great. powerful lineup. Chris and I are quite the powerful lineup. Yes, that's why we don't have anybody else in this podcast ever. We're too powerful. That's not true. Mark Shepard's on it every time with his fingers. Thanks, Mark. Shepard. We're going to rock you out of this world. And now, our opening number. Yes. As the second part of Magical Dreamers, The Wind, Stars, and Waves plays. Yes. Nikki fucking shreds. Yes. We get a low FPS jam session here. You, Mickey, and me twirl. Kid gets in her battle pose and Razzly flies around. Yeah. Serge looks kind of tight on his little drums. Yeah, he looks he's pretty doing, cool. It's kind of weird. It's like, uh, play drums, main character. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, Serge was a traveling musician in another timeline. This is true. He, he, did he play drums then? I'm not sure. Uh, who knows? Talk to Matt Cameron. I, I don't think that you would, tra- if you're a traveling musician, you probably don't do drums because those are hard to transport. Yeah, Maybe. I could you be need wrong. To have like you need to have like a trailer that he. Pro- I don't know. Uh, we have seen the drum animation somewhere else. I think it was part of the the Marbule Muppets for just were... a second. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The Marbule Muppets. <laughs> yeah, Muppet Show on Disney Plus now. The, really? Yeah, I watched an episode today. All the licensed music and shits there. I watched about a half an episode today. It seemed intact, but it's hard to say. I keep saying there's no reason to get Disney Plus, but here we are. Yeah. The camera pans around everyone a few times. It's a neat little sequence. Yeah. So questions, Chris. How did Nikki learn this song from the sage without learning the song from the sage? This is a different Nikki. This is not the Nikki that we knew that was enslaved by but Fargo. the Nikki that we knew had to teach that song to the other Nikki that we knew. No, he didn't. It was the sage that, ta- that taught him. Well, no, this, the oh, sage taught that Nikki. Sa- and then when you go get that third tech, Nikki's like, yo, teach me this fucking song, man. Oh, it's that song. Wow. Remember? So the, this current Nikki would have had to have met the, the other Nikki, the, the Fargo. That or he's a liar. Son he just wanted a, to be friends with himself. Son of a bitch. That or we were out of tracks to provide here. Yeah, interesting. Like, if I met myself from two years ago, you know what I'd say to myself? Though? If I met 2019 February Eric? Yeah. What do you remember about Xenogears? <laughs> yeah. He wouldn't know that I've already talked about Xenogears recently. Yes. Interesting. All right. Okay. Well, God damn. That, that, might, that might work. I mean, the two worlds still exist because we didn't use the Chrono Cross. So maybe there was some some hopping. Um, some homfoolery. Homfoolery, sure. So yes. at the end, Lynx walks out for the Fort Dragonia. Yeah, this is the best part of the ending, I think. A child lost in time plays. He gets in the space elevator and then puts his hand on his chin and thinks. Yeah, he's like, huh. Fade well, out. Well, no one's, no one's coming to stop me. I guess no I got this. Uh, no one's, okay. Yeah, sure. That Great. is a pretty, like, 
Yeah, they, they didn't need that, but it's funny they put no, that in that, there. No, I, I think that's a nice little touch on that ending. I mean, maybe my favorite ending, but that last little moment seals it because that was the next thing that was supposed to happen was we were supposed to head to Fort Dragonia yeah. to, uh, to do that, and uh, we did not have to have the encounter. This also would have implied that Lynx was never able to get into Chronopolis because he never got the Surge body because right. Surge was too busy rocking out. Damn it. <laughs> so Surge saved the world. The end. So how did the Magical Dreamers double their performance budget to add three more members to their production crew? Because uh, Surge has been killing monsters for a while and he's got some money and he just uh, paid his own way. Yeah, okay. 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 He did get the Profiteer's purse from Van's house at this yeah, point. Yeah, he disassembled that shit. And that's it. He disassembled that- all his weapons too. Yeah. Green? Uh, that's a mid-green, like 85 maybe? Yeah, 86. Yeah. 86. One better than the last one. Okay. Ending seven. This is called Surge's Plan or New Beginnings, depending on your source. I have New Beginnings. This ending can be achieved if you defeat the Time Devourer after Surge receives Lynx's body. So you get Sprig and you just go fight that fucking thing. Yeah, I'm sure Sprig is very useful. Did you do any of these back in the day, by the way? I think I maybe did the early one, like mm-hmm. the one you could get early on, the yeah. first couple ones, but I don't think I really took the time because, like I said, like I mentioned before, Diablo 2 was coming out around, around this time. Strangely enough, Diablo 2 Remastered was just announced today. It's all, my life is coming full circle. It's great. I love it everything. Con. Yeah. It is worth mentioning, though, that you had to, like, video on the internet still wasn't readily accessible right, yeah. at this point. You couldn't just go look this shit up. I guess you could if you knew where to look, but I didn't. No, GameFAQs was definitely around, but... You get descriptions, but not... But, oh, yeah, yeah. Not like what it actually was. So, yes, you start this one off in Rebuilt Marbuel. After they build, like, gift shops and houses and all that shit? Yeah. Lynx walks out of the big house on the right, where the pirate was keeping his mermaid wife prisoner. Yes. Harley is in front of this house. There is no music, just bird noises. Yes, and I'm assuming this is actual surge, because this ending occurred after the body swap yes, moment. Yes, yes. So. Other NPCs are here, and everything seems to be fine. Let's just say that, that this dude decided to shack up with the moon dragon instead of killing fate. That's what I would do. Yes. <laughs> give me a choice, I mean, please. Give me the clown. I, my next line is... I love knights. Actually sounds like an okay decision. Yeah. Because... It's not I bad. Mean, sounds pretty good. life. I'm in paradise. You remember there was an actual moment when, when you had to tell Harley what your decision was, uh-huh. even though it didn't matter because this game, nothing, nothing matters. Ooh la la. But in this case... What Surge did mattered, and he's going to hang out with uh, with Harley. So there's also, as we'll see here, there's like a feeling of taking your mentally unfit, unwell grandfather around the village to visit people, feeling to hold this, this oh, thing. Oh, because of the muteness of, of Lynx slash A muteness Surge. and like, there's some trauma that my guys come in to realize he's a cat man forever type thing. Yeah, that is true. Yeah. Anyway, she she's like, oh, hey, we have another grand day ahead of us. And then Marbule and Other World plays as they pair up and walk around Marbule. Yeah, all the townsfolk are coming up to, to Lynx and Harley and being uh, very excited yeah. that he's here. He's a man about town. Yes. The tiger demi-human by the well greets Lynx and they return his greeting like, hello, sir. Hello, sir. They walk up the town square with the benches and the fire barrel. The cricket guy greets them, too. He thinks it's a beautiful day and he's going to work his heart out for this new Marbule. Harley compliments him and tells him to keep up the good work. The child bird thing by the half-finished tent says, Hey, it's Lynxy. Yeah. Then it runs over to him to try and get him to play. Harley rebuffs this child, telling her that Lynx is very busy today. He's not. Lynx and Harley cross the land bridge. A bird lady by Bro of G's shop asks them to do some shopping for her. She says they'll give the pair a discount, and I am very confused by this wording. Anyway, Harley is like, sure, but maybe later. Harley and Lynx remain on the bridge and look over the water. It feels like they're sick of being bothered all the time. But then Irene swims up yeah. and notes Lynx's popularity. Harley says good morning to this siren of the sea. She brings up the person they were looking for, for Irene's, and says to leave it to us. Irene's thanks them for taking on her request. So this is Irene's being like, yo, you know about Fargo? Yeah, I think they're trying to, she's trying to re- still resolve the fargo Nikki situation, mm-hmm. I think. The F and N situation, of course. Yes. Mm-hmm. Harley then asks Lynx, what's on the agenda today? But then the sage walks out of his sage cave. Indeed. He mentions that it's been several months since they've settled in, and the sage wants to discuss something else, though. Mm -hmm. The restoration program's coming along fine, by the way. Yes. He says, well, as you probably know, life in Marbule is beginning to center around you. Unlike before, everybody is generating a positive attitude. This may be a golden opportunity to bring about a change to our dated way of thinking. I am sure we will have to associate with the human folk on equal terms now. I believe it is time for a new leader, and I am too old for this. Harley checks him and says, Are you saying? And the sage says, Yes, exactly. Once you become leader of Marbule, the way we demi-humans view the world will change for the better. I believe you'll be able to bring forth a new age in the history of demi-humans. So is this like, I think you're the one who can get rid of the xenophobia? 
Basically, yeah. The way he's going to spit on yeah. your forehead when you walk in here? Yeah, I think so. I think he wants him to mend the worlds between humans. I, I don't know if they actually understand that this guy used to be Surge, that yeah. he used to be a human or not. It's People just, had a tough time swallowing that, right? Yeah, no. Then the sage leads, mm-hmm. and Harley assures Lynx that they will find a way back to his old self. It's kind of like Harley saying, don't worry, we're eventually going to get back to you, get you back your boy body, but... It's kind of it's kind of a sad a sad moment actually because Serge seems like he's trapped in a yeah. situation. There's nothing he can do. She tries to cheer him up by saying, "Keep in mind, everybody here looks up to you and needs you." He says, "Good day," and then walks back into his cave. Yes. Then the music changes to ephemeral memory, as they once again, as Harley tells him, "There's a way to get his old body back." Until then, let's do what we can for the demi humans who live here. They walk over to Black Dragon Cave, and Harley tells Lynx that he is needed here. "Quote: No matter how you look on the outside, you are you, and that is important." Everybody is looking to you for guidance. You can do it, Monster Lynx. White text. I know you can. Don't worry. I will be by your side. Surge. So has Harley given up that dragon life? Or is she manipulating him? I don't know. Because there's no more goal in mind, right? Like if he killed the time devourer in the normal way? Well, she still wants to get inside of the, the inside of Chronopolis, right? Because no one, no one knows that he killed the time devourer. I guess Harley could have been there. Yeah. She's in the party. Yeah, interesting. With some of these endings, it's more about theming and not interpreting what happens literally, I think. Yeah, yeah. But then that's where it's not over. We have more. Yes, we cut to the pearly gates, right? Mm-hmm. Yes, there's that dripping. Yes. Who's our party? It's Radius, Zappa, and Fargo. That is the, <laughs> these are now the main characters of yeah. Chrono Cross. The old men, the yes. fathers. Brink of Death is playing. They are confronting Dark Surge. Yes, Dark Surge is there. He says, well, 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 if it isn't the three old farts. He'll hear what we have to say. And we each get to talk. Radius says, listen well. The countless evil deeds you have committed cannot go unpunished. We can no longer allow you to do as you please. Prepare yourself. Zappa says, uh, here you be the bastard that killed all the dragoons dead. That's why I'm here, to avenge my son. Is that true? Well, he knows Karsh is is, is lost, right? Cause yeah, but Dark Surge didn't do that. Is a Chronopolis, or a, a, a Miguel. It was, I mean, it was Lynx's fault, though, because Lynx is the one that yeah, lived in there, right? I guess so. So... Fargo says, Arg, I too am a villain, but me reasons are just. You're nothing but a disgrace. I just really like how he admitted to also being a villain, yeah. <laughs> which is pretty funny. Perhaps it's time for me to become a villain. Dark Surge says he doesn't have time to deal with us. Then Kid walks out and holds up her fist. She won't let us get in the way of Surge's plan. Surge then replies, that's the way it goes. But I do need to get used to my new body. I'll make a special exception today and take you on as well. Radius tells the scandal to prepare, and Kid is like, anytime you're ready, Surge takes a step forward, and it fades to black. This feels like two endings jammed into one, kind of. It does, and we often wondered throughout the podcast, like, what was up with Kid when she was kind of on Team Dark Surge? Yeah. And we wondered if she was being controlled, or if she was just being manipulated. 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 I think that, I think this kind of clears that up a little bit, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. The Time Devourer ship was powering Did her. Did she not notice that Surge changed his clothes and he talks more now? He talks differently? I think it was like, you know, just a blackout period where yeah. she's under control of a different influence. Yeah. I'm going to give that a yellow, yellow minus. Yeah, that's a low yellow, I think. I, I like the whole idea of them settling down and Surge settling yeah, down nice. and being ushered around the town at, at, like a local And like boy. it's also a small tragedy. Yeah, yeah. That, 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 yes, this inning is very tragic, I think. Who do you think won that battle, by the way? <laughs> Three old men. Yeah. Who couldn't forge rainbow equipment yet. Yeah. I'm going to have to say they all died there at the uh-huh. early gates. Yeah. That's what happened. But Chris, we continue on to ending eight. Pride and Honor or Onward Dragoons? Onward Dragoons. Onward Dragoons. You can get this ending if the Time Devourer is murdered right after rescuing Riddell from Viper Manor, but not before going to Hermit's Hideaway. This starts off in Viper Manor. General Viper is seen riding the chair elevator down to the banquet hall. All the dragoons are in four lines with Norris the cook in the back right. Zoa and Marcy are up front and Karsh is off to the right. Karsh tells them all to stand up straight, and they do. Hmm. Karsh says, General, the time has finally come for all the dragoons to sally forth. They have been talking to Maria Balthazar in her sally forthness. <laughs> yes, I love Maria Balthazar and Karsh, so it's full circle. Right. Marcy asks if she can kill them all. Viper thinks about this, but then music, the dragoons plays, and Viper says, Everyone prepare yourself to face Lynx's army. Long live the pride and honor of the Acacia dragoons. Dialogue boxes fill the screen as they agree with the general. So Lynx's army is just poor military, right? Yeah, well, there's implication later that also those demon cats and some, some, of, oh, the, some yeah. of the monsters that we've been fighting along the way are also part of Lynx's army. Sure. 
Norris walks to the center of the floor. He speaks. It appears the battle is unavoidable. I'm sure the poor Omri will strike back in full force. Perhaps this too is fate. He leaves and no one notices that the dishwasher was A here and B left. Yes. <laughs> Everyone marches out and the scene fades to black. And now... Zoe and Marcy lead that charge. Yes. We are now on the SS Invincible. A battle is raging. Dragoons and pirates are fighting shadow cats and imps. Yes. We cut to the thinking deck. Yes. Where Dark Surge is doing some thinking. Yes. Marcy, Fargo, Zoa, Karsh, and Viper approach him, and Fargo starts smoking. <laughs> Fargo always smokes when he's idle. Surge slash Lynx says, shall we get started? More of the sheep herding imp things from Fossil Valley fall out of the sky. That's it? That's it. That's it. Next, we go to Marbule. It's the witch doctor's hut. Marbule homeworld plays. Lynx and Harley are both in here. Harley thinks this is a nice change of pace and enjoys taking it easy. She's used to travel over the place with the other Lynx. She's never been in one place for so long. She wishes it could be like this a bit longer. She then says, well, time for dinner. We can respond with, your specialty or the squall lion-hearted, whatever. I pick Harley's specialty, and she says she will do her best. She tells Lynx to wait here while she goes to steal, I mean, to go get some ingredients. Then Kid walks in. Knife and shit. Yes, knife in hand. She's finally found Lynx, the girl who stole the star's plays. That's an interesting song choice right there because the, like, it doesn't play Brink of Death because we're about to have this epic battle. It, it's playing that song because this is almost a tragedy right yeah, here. Yeah, it's itself. fate. This is almost like a sequel to the previous ending, right? Yeah, they, kind they of. Both kind of. They both kind of could have existed in the same. Like, this could have been their life. Yeah. Harley is impressed that Kid is still alive. Kid's like, of course I am. I have more lives than a cat. Kid asks Lynx what he's doing here, then tells him this is pathetic. This whole situation is pissing her off. Lynx shakes his head as Kid tells Lynx to prepare himself. He's not getting away this time. He's going down. Fade to black. That's Holy it. shit, it's sad. They had retired, but their nemesis didn't, which is a lot of things you say in, in like Westerns and other yeah. movies about hitmen and forgiveness and duty. Yeah, I kind of like that scene. The scene before where Lynx's army was fighting the pirates and whatnot, like that was already implied that happened in the regular timeline because when we first met Fargo... He said that he's had several run-ins with, oh, yeah. with Lynx along the way. So, we only saw the pirate skeleton battle. Yeah, exactly. So this ending, like, with, with the exception of the Lynx and Harley stuff, this ending kind of could have fit into a, a good chunk of the of the game proper. Yeah. Like, there's not a lot, of, a lot of difference there. Nonetheless, I like that last scene a lot. It's pretty sad. So I would give this one a middle green. Uh, I would give high yellow, low green. But yeah, the sadness, I appreciate how Chrono Cross isn't averse to creating tragedies from these endings like there there's a mixture of jokey tragedy serious stuff although we haven't gotten the most tragic one yet so we'll get there yes <sighs> ending nine record of fate or the darkened fate yes the darkened record of fate maybe <laughs> this ending is available after harley leaves the party which chris and i didn't notice when we played this game <laughs> yes I, that's after she talks to starkey if you have starkey yes we get the chronopolis music time fortress chronopolis Kid and Dark Surge are in this lobby. Yep. They approach the elevator room, but Kid turns around. Dark Surge stops too and asks Kid if something is wrong. Kid's like, yeah, it looks like we've got company. Mm -hmm. She'll hold them off while Dark Surge goes on ahead. Dark Surge goes to the next room and we see Harley run up the same central pathway. Harley says Kid's name and Kid's like, not you again. I thought yeah. you were with the Lynx. Harley responds with confusion as to why Kid is here. Then asks to be let through. Kid walks forward and says, fuck that. It'll take more than a please to be let through. Over my dead body, she replies. This too could have happened in the main game. Yeah. Like this maybe should have been a scene in the main game yeah. to ramp up the tension a little bit there. You wonder if these were like scenarios that were just deleted or if they were written. Like I want to know when these were made in the creation process. Yeah. Harley tells Kid it is senseless for them to fight. They must stop Surge. Then she corrects herself to say they must stop Lynx. Kid responds by telling Harley to stay out of it, saying it's as simple as I don't like you. She doesn't care if it's seamless for them to fight. Harley says, I drive a Honda Accord. Yeah. No, she says Decord, which we, French fake what did we say that meant? Okay. Chris a raison. Thanks, American Chris. <laughs> You're welcome. And this cannot be helped. Kid tells Harley to face the music and put up her dukes. Great line. Dukes, yes, always put up your dukes. What's your favorite sequence of putting up your dukes? Uh, I can't think of it on top of my head. It's sort of a good one. Yeah. End of American Beauty. Uh, mm -hmm. When Chris Cooper's in the rain, when he thinks Kevin Spacey is uh, dating his son or whatever, and he, he puts up his fist to try to fight him because he only knows how to solve problems through violence. Okay, good. Then we go to Arnie Village. Noises. Birds. 
A man walks in the elder's hut and approaches the record of fate. Yeah. He turns to look at the sleeping cat, greeting it good morning and telling him he hopes they don't mind. I do this every day, Chris. Yeah, you take it familiar. I've got to save my life real quick. Yeah. I've got to upload my brain to fate. My cats understand. Yes. The camera pans up and a woman chopping watermelon asks the man if he's here to consult the record of fate again and notes his devotion. I think Chrono Cross undersold this for a lot of people. Yeah. Like it was important at the start and then they just treated like, I mean, I guess, you know, if you treat it like a telephone, like we oh, it's like, yeah, my telephone. Of course I use this all yeah. the time. I have to know what the tweets are. Well, th- this game kind of left a lot of things dangling from the, from act one all the way to act three. Like a lot of the middle stuff didn't make a lot of pulls from the first act, which I can think made this game a little weaker. Hmm. So then later she tells this old ass man that he's still young, but to take his time. He walks up to the record of fate and then it fades to darkness. He spits exclamation points and says, holy cow. Holy shit. Holy potatoes. Time Fortress Chronopolis plays as he backs away and shakes. He doesn't know which direction to run. He screams, this can't be, and asks for help. The woman asks what's wrong. She walks over and he points out what happened. She says, oh my. She wonders why it has turned black. And he says, how the heck should I know? He's going to go call the chief. He hopes this isn't a bad omen. He runs out the door screaming the word chief and it fades to black. Have you ever been into like a large big box store and the power dies? There's just a collective groan from everybody that everything is now fucked. Yeah. Yes. (laughs) Yeah. Finally, I can't, uh, I I can't get my 72 pack of toilet paper, my record of fate. Same thing. This again seems like a scene that could have worked in the game a little bit. Yeah. I know that like what we're about to see didn't happen, but it, it seems like something that could have happened as dark surge approach this moment it's real to me god damn it yeah the scene then returns to chronopolis and dark surge who is We're in the fate chamber indeed he's looking at the frozen flame science ball thing frozen flame place yes i'm glad we got to hear the song again i like the song he does some villain shit here and says that he will become fate you have the quote like he floats with his hands in his pockets he says i shall become fate and the camera pans up and he laughs maniacally as it fades to black so this is the ending where the bad guy gets what he wants right yeah. like surge didn't get there to First of all, Serge didn't get his body back, I guess, based on when this ending would, would have been achieved. And he also didn't make it to Chronopolis in order to stop this moment. This probably could have happened as well, too, if Dark Surge would have just done his shit instead of waiting to deliver his villain speech. Like, yeah. that whole final encounter didn't make much sense, but... Like, villains should never deliver their villain speech, but also they wouldn't be villains if they didn't have a villain speech to deliver. They just got a time. paradox. The, the timing is always off on these villains. They're always waiting way too long to deliver these things. So that ends that sequence, right, Eric? That's it. So now we're on to ending. No, now the... we rate it, Chris. Oh, yeah. Um, yellow. Middle yellow for I, me. I've got a low yellow there because I, th- I feel like a good chunk of this could have been in the game and it would have made the game a little bit better. Hey there, this is Jeremy Parrish, and if you're a fan of classic video game soundtracks, or if you just love 20-minute rock epics about war-ready armadillos that battle Catholicism, you should listen to Alexander's Ragtime Band. Join the power trio of myself, Elliot Long, and James Eldred each month as we talk about the most pretentious music of all, progressive rock, right here on the Greenlit Podcast Network. Previously, in Zelda 2, on Chat of the Wild. Until you get to the elevator. Hey, where you going? <laughs> right. I'm on it. I'm like, stay away from me, and you and your little flamey. <laughs> he just chases you. I'm like, uh, I'm like, no, 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 run, 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 run. I love that. I love that idea. It's like we have this whole grand adventure where we're building ourselves up, and every time we get into power, it's like, oh god, oh god, oh god, it's like just running through. <laughs> That's Chat of the Wild Wednesdays on the Greenlit Podcast Network. Next, we're on to ending 10, Galaxy Night slash a career change. Yes, a career change. How do you get this ending, Chris? This ending is available after you fight Dario, but before Terra Tower rises from the ocean. We start off in Viper Manor. Yes. Now, we got a little bit of a hint of this ending. If you take General Viper to Viper Manor as Dario is rebuilding it, there are some kids who jokingly ask if he's the headmaster. Mm -hmm. So this kind of parlays into that a little bit. Optimism plays as Viper rides the chair elevator down to the main hall. Yeah, this is kind of funny because it echoes the... uh, General Kid. General Kid, yes. It echoes the general kid scene where the instead of there's being a bunch of soldiers lined up, it's mm-hmm. just a bunch of children. Yes, they're reusing animation routines. Yes, it's great. Dario and a dragoon are up front. Riddell is off to the side. Riddell says attention, and all the kids stand up straight. She says good morning to everyone, and the children do a good morning, Miss Riddell yeah. sing-along mm-hmm. as if they were children in a school. 
Riddell says they're going to hear a word from their headmaster. She defers to, quote, Daddy. 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 Daddy doesn't know what the fuck to say here, does he? No. He clears his throat, stutters, and says, work hard and play hard, kids. Yeah, then the kids take him at face value and start scrambling around the entire room. It totally tracks that Viper is a rise and grind asshole and only finds definition through work. Unlike me, the person who spends 40 hours a week in an unfulfilling job and comes home to work out on podcasts the rest of my shit day. <laughs> Yeah, those kids are going ham. Dario's here too. He gives a bunch of platitudes like the children are the future Dude, or some shit. The dog, the kids are running around like the dogs I see in the daycare at PetSmart. Yeah. You ever go there and see them just running around playing and shit? Yeah. A dragoon asked Dario if this is what he wanted, and Dario is loving this shit. He knows how the kids look like they are bursting with joy. He thinks it's hard to believe we live in a barbarous, 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 barbecuous barbarous? world. I don't know. These are the kids that will shape the next generation. Dario is sure the general is in full agreement. Dario looks to Viper for confirmation. Viper slurs his words again, then starts laughing. The Dragoon asks Viper if they should start a, a Dragoon youth group, which is never a good idea. Kill the elementary to school to nationalistic military pipeline, please. Yes, I wrote that Dario suggested that they start the Hitler Youth, yeah, basically. <laughs> Hitler Youth is what yeah. I was kind of yeah. gesturing toward here. So when Viper laughs, do you think he's laughing because he can't believe this shit? Like this is where his life is? Or like this is what has become of Dario, his fucking prized pupil? Like, or is it like, is, is Viper also into perhaps being grandfather instead of master mind? I think he's laughing at Dario's suggestion be like, oh yeah, we can turn this back into a military if, if, I, re if I really need to. I guess so. Yeah. There's just been like sequences in my life where I've been so angry that laughter is the only option. Yeah. So yeah. I don't know. Hmm. So this, uh, when this happens, Dario and the Dragoon then laugh. So I like the idea of Dario trying to do good, but having no way to express that goodwill other than a deeper investment in military shit. <laughs> yes. He has no idea how to form groups that use solutions other than violence to solve problems. The man is broken, sent him to rehab or community service or the insights program I did in high school. Holy shit. <laughs> With Riddell standing behind him, Dario says they must keep this a secret from Riddell. They laugh hysterically. The Dragoon then asks about operating costs, which is the first time anybody in this game has ever worried about money. Dario says not to worry. He has an idea. The Dragoon seems to know what Dario is talking about, but Dario cuts him off and says they must keep it a secret from Riddell, unlike the other secret he just talked about literally in front of Riddell. Yeah, it seems like she overheard that anyway, though, didn't she? Again, they both cackle in laughter. Yeah. Riddell asks what is so amusing. Dario, not hearing her, says, perhaps we can have Riddell work there, too. The Dragoon says, are you serious, sir? I'll be a regular for sure. They both laugh maniacally. The scene fades to black. Chris, this is the darkest ending. I think so. They're definitely talking about like selling Riddell's body, correct? That's what the that's the vibes I'm getting here. Oh, uh, I didn't. I, I, mm. I thought they were just cackling about the revival of dragoons. I read it as sexual slavery. No, their idea is to open the bar that we're about to go to. Oh fuck! You dumbass. Yeah, because this scene's not over. The dragoon. Okay. So the idea is that then manifests in Termina. So then the scene fades to black. And, Bartender. Yes, Dark Surge. A child lost in time, please. Yes, Dark Surge, Harley, and Kid are arriving in Termina. He says this place will soon be a ghost town. He can't believe it was so recently full of life. He guesses he is responsible for all of this, then laughs his ass off. Dark Surge concludes it is time to wreak some havoc. Harley stops this tirade and says all this walking has made her fatigued. She begs to rest somewhere. Kid agrees. Dark Surge agrees and looks for somewhere to rest in this town. They look toward the bar they are standing directly in front of. Dark Surge said it's hard to believe such a place would still be in business during these wretched times. Hmm. Dark Surge concludes this is a good idea, as they may be able to use the bar to gather information. They walk inside the bar. Yep. Snakebone Mansion plays. Yeah, that's the right Viper. song for yeah. a, a Viper bar, right? Dark Surge says this place doesn't look too bad, despite the pre-rendered backgrounds that have always have half-eaten food and a half-full glasses of beer on the table. <laughs> yeah, that's true. He asked for a table and... He asked for a hostess. Lucha is the bartender, He's the I goddamn think. bartender. Yeah, she says, Welcome to Viper Bar, Karsh, Marcy. See that they get the best table in the house. Then Karsh says, Right this way, my beautiful ladies! Mar salt and Pepper are here, too. Yeah, salt. Yeah, they're kind of in the back, just kind of chilling. Uh, I'm very uncomfortable with Marcy's disposition in this entire... The child working in a bar? Well, not only that, but she almost acts like she's a cabaret worker. Yeah. She hangs out at the table. Yeah. We'll get to that in a second. Yeah. Need that, need that towel? Yeah. Marcy says, hey, good looking. Why don't you join me here? That's kind of fucked up. Yeah, that, that, yeah that's what I was referring to. Yeah. Dark Surge's party stands around the table because there are no chairs. Karsh tries to take their order. May I take your order? Dark Surge orders an ice-cold beer on tap. Yeah. 
Harley says, no, 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 you are underage. You may be Lynx on the inside, but you are a 17-year-old boy. Kid agrees with this and asks if they have any non-alcoholic specials. Karsh recommends the house special. What's it called, Chris? It's called the Galaxy Night. I'm sorry, Karsh is saying the house special. Please say that again. Then they recommend our house special, Galaxy Night. Is a mellow blend of bellflower and soda that is sure to quench the thirst. The thirst? What it says here. I've got their thirst. Gatorade, drink it up. Kit all sport. Kit orders that and Harley, a woman of taste, opts for a Dendoro Mountain Blend with two creams and ten sugars. Whoa. It's a lot. Yeah, Serge, it's like Harley, a little heavy on the sugar, aren't you? Harley says it just makes her sweeter for Serge, what I think Bricktop said in Snatch. Yes. Marcy, calling Dark Surge handsome, also orders a Galaxy Knight. Yeah. Dark Surge agrees and orders one for her and himself. This is very uncomfortable. Karsh yells the order over to Salt and Pepper. Salt walks and it's forward to Lucha, who starts to make it. She then calls over to Pepper and says they have more customers waiting. The camera pans over to reveal who has just walked in. Some Starkies. Two Starkies. Yes. The script lists them as Star Kids, <laughs> so I'll take it. We can refer to them as Star Kids now. Pepor directs them to the other table and stands on the opposite side. He asks to shake their order. Quote, give us all the liquid substances you have in this box. <laughs> this is my favorite line from Chrono Cross. <laughs> I think you're right. Uh, Pepor is very confused. He uh, He's like, box, liquid? So you want to shake it and try all the drinks we have here right away? Yeah. And then Dark Surge refers to these Star Kids as weirdos, which is maybe like if a couple of aliens walk into a bar, you, you're going to use a stronger word than weirdos. Hey, mind your fucking business. Yeah. How about that? Yeah. She, but Harley wants to have a toast. Dark Surge agrees and toasts to their glory. Glasses clink as it fades to black. When it comes back up, Dark Surge wishes Surge was of legal drinking age. Marcy orders another drink without finishing her previous drink, which pisses off Dark Surge. Chris, do kids do this? No, I think this is, a, again, a, a, a cabaret worker technique where okay. they're like, oh, oh, trying yes. to, like, no, yeah, you're right. yeah I, they're you trying know, to run the bill up. I beat that minigame in Yakuza 0 and Kiwami 2. I should know this yeah. at this point. Yeah, Marcy explains that all the ice melted while they were talking. She wants an ice cold one. Dark Surge tiredly complies and orders one more Galaxy Night. It pans back over to the Starkies who have no portrait. I guess they started drinking the drinks. One asks what the other has concluded. The reply... That all the creatures on this planet are rank K. It's pretty low, I guess. Yeah, and no unusual substances are in the liquid. They must contact the mothership from the summoned mothership and commence their attack at once. Then one of them says, there's no rush. You need to wait for their comrade, who has preceded them to make contact. He should be traveling with the locals of this planet. It will not be too late if they wait until then. So is Starkey a spy? Or, or, or have we warmed his heart? There's two possibilities. Starkey, I think, is a spy. We have warmed his heart. Or this is the existence where Starkey's dead. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. If the ship's intact, he's dead. Right. They say Nuna Nuna and Nani Nani paying homage to Mork from Orc as they flip their domes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. The camera pans back over to... I, I like the two camera shot here where it just goes back and forth between these two groups of weirdos. Yeah. And kids like, hey, you want to head out soon? Harley expects Dart Surge to pick up the check. Dark Surge agrees, but he wants to make sure they keep up the good work. What good, like what, being henchmen? I, I guess. Dark Surge asks the check he brought to him. Harley, Kid, and Karsh, for some reason, all walk outside. Marcy remains. Lucha says to please pay at the counter, like all the Mexican places around here. Thank you very much, sir. Ladies, I really enjoy your company today. Please do stop by again. Here is my card. Yes, Horny Karsh gives them his business card. Yeah, it's weird. I'm not really sure. What, what is Karsh's it... job and what does it say on the card? That's a good question. I don't know. I think he's just running interference for what's about to happen, really. Okay. Okay. You know, there is precedent for this bar being the old Dragoon hideout with that shit in the basement, right? Yeah, that's true, yeah. Dark Surge is very surprised at the bill, and he notes that it looks like there is an extra zero on the total. Lucha doubles down, stating that that was the correct amount. Dark Surge says Lucha has to be out of her fucking mind. He can't pay it. He's not that liquid. Lucha says that if he can't pay... He should step inside their consultation room next door. Consultation room. That's usually a room they have at like car dealerships and stuff. Yes. But a I don't... Consultation room where you talk to the finance guy about your payments. Yeah. Do you have a consultation? I've never seen a consultation room at the at a bar. Hey, Chris, here's a question. You ever try to not pay your bill at a bar? Me? Yeah. Uh, then you haven't seen the consultation room, Chris. I've, I've never tried to, to ditch yeah. a bar. Try but... it out and you'll see the consultation room. Okay. The bouncers will kick your ass. The bouncers. The bouncer. Okay. The Spice Boys turn and watch him go inside as Surge, Dark Surge says, you bet I will. 
you don't know who you're dealing with. Who's inside that side room in the consultation room, Chris? It's Zoa, still shirtless. So is Lucha. She's in here too. Yes. Dark Surge says this price is ridiculous and that he's going to sue, indicating they have a legal system here. Zoa steps forward and says, no, no, you do not know who you are dealing with. Yeah. Dark Surge calls this a ripoff joint. He doesn't believe this. It's also the title of an unnamed future segment on this podcast, The Ripoff Joint. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Car says, ha, 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 easy money. <laughs> and Marcy notes that they will reach their quota for this month. Y- Yarsh. Karsh says, yeah, but still, all I want to know is when we can start wreaking some havoc again. I'm not cut out for this kind of stuff. All cops are bastards. Marcy challenges <laughs> this, suggesting Karsh is more of a ladies' man. Karsh, Whatever. Karsh hits her with the... Whatever. And it fades to black. Oh, God. So they're definitely just running like a racketeering business here, right? Like they're just, they're just, yeah, they're leasing these people. Yeah. Th- th- this is to raise money for the orphanage. So uh, maybe this is not bad. I don't know. I mean, in this case, they're fleecing aliens and in and, and bad guys. Yeah, but... bad guys. This is like an extension of Shop with a Cop program. <laughs> <laughs> like this is the natural end to that in this world. Yeah. Yeah. Rehab your damn image. Wow. Jesus Christ. I'm going to give that about a green minus. I'm giving it a high green because it's, pre- it's pretty funny. Yeah. It works. It's the Starkeys really... were, were wonderful. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of, there's like several pl- plots going on here and, and they all kind of intersect and it, it really works for me. Ending 11, Wicked Deeds slash Return of the Downtrodden. I really like the title Return of the Downtrodden. Yeah, dude. It really kind of foreshadows how bleak this ending is. Yes, and this is definitely the bleakest ending like this to me is the only ending that feels like real and not any jokey elements anywhere in it yeah uh, so this is available after terra tower is in the sky but but before i guess it, it has grown its fucking dumbass head and stuff so we started sky dragon isle yeah two figures in silhouette are standing idle tower of stars is playing the dragon god states finally and then comes down to greet two figures it's the dwarf chieftain He says the remaining survivors of his clan have gathered here on this island. The other figure is the sage. He says the demi-humans of Marbule have gathered here as well. The dragon god says, Excellent. The time is nigh. Those who defy our plans have been eliminated. Not a soul can interfere now. Let us stain the planet with the blood of humanity. The impotent humans who believe they are the sole rulers. Genocide, Chris. Yeah, that's some harsh dialogue, and I'm, I'm sad it's buried in this ending because it's, it's pretty intense. The sage, true to character, asks if there are any other alternatives. The dwarf chieftain is taken aback, stating, What are you talking about? Have you forgotten their wicked deeds? Hi-ho. 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 If we do not do something about this now, the humans will certainly destroy this planet. The dragon god then cuts in. Now be off. Eliminate these foolish mortals who are eating away at the planet. It is our turn to dream anew at the planet. The dwarf enthusiastically agrees as the sage spits out some dots. Yeah. So, Chris, are they being, like, imbued with power here to fight this war? Maybe so. Because they, they it's not like they got any more, like, members of their squads. Yeah, maybe the dragon god is helping resurrect them or, or something or giving them some, uh, I don't know, rainbow equipment. <laughs> yeah. The chief then speaks. Hi-ho, prepare for the worst, you filthy humans. Hi-ho. Now where should we begin the bloodbath, hi-ho? Hi-ho. Hi-ho. The chief scampers off. The sage remains and spits out more periods. The sage then also calmly starts walking away. Then he turns around and stares at the dragon god. He stops and he wonders if they are truly doing the right thing. He then walks down the steps. The camera pans back out to the dragon god and we get some white text. Humans, let this be a lesson for the countless sins you've committed over the past thousand years. There is no turning back now. Black scream. White text. How many years has it been since I last visited? We're in Arnie Village, but there's no Arnie music. It's just birds chirping. It's occupied by the demi-humans, but otherwise it looks the same. A bro of G is manning the vendor stall, but then Lost Fragments plays. We get to see Harley walking around town, sullen and sighing. She looks in all directions. A voice with no name says they had a blast watching all those humans run for their lives. Quote, they were all looking down on the demi-humans. I'd pay a million Gs. To see their faces filled with fear, humiliation, and disgrace Jesus. again. Jesus. And they laugh maniacally. Yep. The camera pans up to the two demi-humans by the vendor stall. God, this, this one's harsh. <laughs> the, the, the woman says, Oh, I can't use these filthy utensils after a human has touched them. Don't you agree? And they look over at Harley. She it's, no-sells the question. Yeah. But yeah, that's fucking, it's like, uh, the, other, the other one says, Gather around, ladies. 
I brought with me today utensils direct from Marbule. They're clean and they last forever. Oh my, wonderful. How much are they? White people used to think they needed their own fountains, Chris. Yeah, that's true. America. Dragon God. Dwarves walk out of the kitchen restaurant. Quote, El Nido is finally at peace now that the humans are gone. But what if the troops from the mainland are sent to survey the area? Hi-ho. The Dragon God is watching over us. Humans are no match for us now. So I guess the Dragon God did help. Yeah. With the, with the extermination squads. Yeah. Harley dumps some more periods, then says, hmm. She walks to the center of town and stands still. She looks left. She looks right. She kneels down and picks something up. When she stands up, she's holding something green, wondering if these flowers will do. She walks out of town and the screen fades to black. She walks up to the ledge at Cape Howell. She kneels by the grave and sets the flower down. She breathes. She stays kneeling. She says nothing. The camera pans to the left and it fades to black. That's it. That's harsh. It's sad. Yeah. <laughs> That's really harsh, dude. The downtrodden have returned, murdered all the humans, and the only one that has any sympathy for them is... Is Harley. Is Harley. Is Harley. Yeah. Who, in effect, was, like, instrumental in causing it, too. That is, like, definitely reaping what you sow and, like, yeah. looking at the disaster. Like, man, that's that's what happens when you, you choose the, the black path and have to deal with your consequences, which the powerful usually don't have to do. The only thing that's missing from this ending is some humans, like, the poor army from the mainland arriving being like, what the fuck is yeah. going on? <laughs> just the blood path, just <laughs> dwarfs and demi-humans, like... We had reports there were humans here. Yeah, it's uh, it's something. So let's score that one. I'm going to give that one like a 95. I'm going to give it 100. Okay. I love that ending. That yes. is my favorite ending of all of this shit. 10 out of 10. Okay, great. So we have one left. It is the programmers slash developers ending. I want to say this one wasn't as well known back in the day. The programmers ending? Yeah, it's like, it's, it's not the easiest thematic. one to get. Oh, it is? Cause, yeah, Never mind. you get this one if you go and immediately defeat the time devourer you can't recruit Pashul but or isn't anything. that hard with like by yourself um yeah the they've been like multiple runs through the game to get this high i guess so but i mean it, i guess you couldn't do it if you didn't craft the spectral swallow because you don't get to carry the master immune over yeah so i don't know it's it's, it's, it's possible you could you, you could swing it but there was also a programmer's ending in chrono triggers there is some precedent for this Patreon.com slash RetroAM, our Terranigma miniseries, 16 episodes. And one of those episodes, we went to a developer's room that's you can find during the game, which is... It's basically the whole city of um, Neo Tokyo? Yeah, yeah, there, there's a... There's a after Neo you, Tokyo place. Yes, yeah, so you, kill, you kill a ghost from the trash or something, and yeah. then you unlock And the, you wind up in Enix's office. Yeah. Or not Qu Enix. Quintet, um, yeah. Quintet's office. And that was fucked up. Yeah, it's fucked up because there is uh, an, an expression of relief that the game is done and a a sort of a wistfulness of like not seeing my family and yeah. sleeping in the office and stuff like that and the this crash pad yes and this this ending here in chrono cross has a similar vibe to it but it's a it's a bit more elaborate so here's some pretext here one all the names are in japanese because this is a japanese made game chris and i will probably butcher these two this was hard to organize so i may be going in a different order than chris apologize for how that's going to unfold so we're in Viper Manor. The splendidly grand magic troupe plays. Yes, this is the Sneff performance song. Yes. I think this is the only time we hear it, aside from when, when we uh, first met Sneff. It's, yeah, it's in that, feels that, like that a waste. show, yeah. yeah. It feels like a waste uh, that we did. It's kind of like Frozen Flame. It only plays once in the actual game. <laughs> yes, the, the two most sacred things in the video game are Sneff, Sneff and the Frozen Flame. <laughs> yes, confirmed. Thank you. God damn it. So Salt and Pepor welcome us to the developer's room, us the player. It's where the development team gets to shake their thanks to the player. They argue with each other, mentioning that they're going off script. We can speak to them if we want to leave, and we won't be able to shake it out of here otherwise. Yes. So what, how this is situated is there's a bunch of NPCs in Viper Manor, and talking to them actually reveals a bit of dialogue from a programmer or somebody who helped make the game. I don't know if we know this for a fact, but the, I think we surmised in the Terra Enigma session that these were probably written by the developers themselves, like a quote that was yes. written to put in the game. You know? They feel a whole lot like if you um, listen to our Perfect Works series or just read uh, Ultimate Graphics translation of Perfect Works, there's some blurbs from the team at the end and they all sound very similar to this. The theme is, we worked hard on this. I'm fucking tired. I hope you enjoy it. I would love to see my wife and children again. Yes. 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 Until the next game. So we start in the foyer. First person I speak to is Suachi Sato. Yes. Sato, yes. Sato, quote, I was in charge of the battle effects, and I was just so busy. I didn't even have time to tend to my butt hairs. Just kidding about butt the hairs. butt hairs. Butt hairs. <laughs> butt hairs. This is, thank you, Richard. But let me tell you about my goatee. It's not like I'd had the bristles, 
but there's some red hair mixed in there. See? Black hair, black hair, red hair. Red hair, red hair, black hair. Yeah, they're punched us in the face with the shit right yeah, off the get. I saw here. this shit and I was like, oh boy, we're in for a ride. Yeah, yeah. The, <laughs> the next one is Kanji Oiwa. Mm-hmm. He says, oh, Tiyoshi, the player's finally here. Man, we sure waited a long time. I thought you might have called it quits. What? <laughs> There's something you'd like to discuss. Mix Jello with, and the bomber jacket will appear to place a rubber band on your cup. What on earth are you talking about? Listen, you're not getting any younger, so stop playing games all the time and spend some time with your daughter. Heat cup provolone soccer mom. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> this is like um, some free association exercise. Mixed. Yeah. I think like a lot of these, I think, are in jokes razzing somebody else on the team. Like, what do you like if someone if you had to make, I don't know, a dialogue of something that like something I have to put in, like my speech that someone reads at my funeral. Most will be comments just fucking with people. Yeah. Right. Like, that's what's happening here. Yeah. So the last person here is Yoshiro Akiyami, who just says Kung Fu is awesome. Yeah, I think that guy's off to the side in the hallway. Yeah. It's important to note they're all kind of grouped around what their specialty was. Like, who would they be working with when they made the game? Yeah. Zelbus plays. Hitoshi Oguchi says, I did all the character animations, like the character you're controlling now, and a whole bunch of deadly ones. I'm sorry if they were over your head. I hope there was at least one character you liked. Well, see ya. A lot of the themes here is they'll be talking about playing the game multiple times and figuring out the secrets, not aware that we're playing this in 2020 with guides. There's also another character in here named Norizaku Sato, who is a cat. Yes. I made all the various creatures of this world, and there were plenty, let me tell you. Actually, the character you're controlling now and the others around you all started off as one tiny little gray box. Well, I hope to see you again in another world. Bye. That's kind of mind-blowing. I mean, now Chris and I are of the age where we've seen gray box prototypes for games, shit like yeah. that. But to think of it like that when you're a kid is um, yeah. revelatory. Yeah, this stuff is genuinely interesting, especially probably in, in the year 2000. Yeah. Next I've got Mika Nunokawa. Yes. Why do we have so many characters? That's what I kept asking myself when I was drawing all of them. Yes. Oh, well. I think she should have been in the room when they were greenlighting the characters. <laughs> right. <laughs> like, this is this is the problem here. You to she, do what? She could have helped solve this. Okay, I've, I've got Senataro Hota. Yes. Hey, how's it going? I was in charge of magic and other effects. Man, I am burned out. My memories of the summer 1999, I was at the beach... In my dreams. In your dreams. Yes, it was a nice, amusing dream, except for the sea of blood. <laughs> and lastly, here's some advice to all my friends, young and old. Don't cast any magic with your nose pressed against the TV screen. Did you forget uh, to close the TV when you were a kid and your parents would give you some shit about your eyes? Fucking up. Uh, I think my, at first, yeah, probably, but I think that they eventually gave up. Chris, do you wear glasses or contacts? No. Nor do I. Yeah. False information. Yes, thank you. Good. Good job. Thanks. Sorry, Dad. So, finally here we have Yufuko Hate, who yes. is Pip. Yeah. I did some battle effects and worked on Pip's design. I joined the team midway, but I feel good about what I accomplished. Some of my memorable moments were watching the sunrise and fireworks outside our office window and a late night trip to the video store in Ibisu to rent Flamenco. Hmm. Fignet, what's that about? Initializing Fignet. Flamenco is a 1995 Spanish documentary film directed by Carlos Saura with camera work by cinematographer Vittorio Storaro. The film is entirely musical and dancing vignettes, composed and photographed on a soundstage. It's pretty good. I need to add variety to my daily routine. Do you think we'll meet again? Hmm. I thought Ibisu was in Osaka. I guess I'm wrong because that's a square is in Tokyo, right? I, I don't know. The only thing that I relate to in this line is I need to add variety to my daily routine. Yes. <laughs> you know? Spice it up. Do the same shit every day. Yeah. Okay. Next. Uh, n- n- where, where do you want to go next? Next, I have something I like to call left hall, left room. Home Arnie plays when we walk in here. Hikaru Anzai says, I worked really hard on the movies, so hard, in fact, that I got blisters on my fingers from all the texturing. Well, they have to, like, a texture ball or something? Got to push hard? I think just mouse clicks, yeah. stuff, yeah. programming, typing shit in. We all worked really hard on them, so be sure to watch them. Yes. And, Sir, and, this was 2000. This is all people were watching. <laughs> yes. In 2000, in, I'm sorry, in, in 10 years, please put them on the internet so people can watch them over and over again. In five years, you'll watch this, all of your cutscenes with Jimmy Eat World playing over the background. <laughs> The next person is Ko Arai. It says, thanks for playing. I really mean it. And then the next person I have is Kiyoshi Yoshi. Yeah, great name. 
we're finally done. Ah, I can sleep in peace. Hey, you should get some rest too. You know that? Good night and R E S E T. Reset. Reset. What? Hi, I'm Reset Smith. Hoppies. It resets the game screen back to the title, Chris. Yeah, this fucked me up even though I was watching this on YouTube. <laughs> I mean, yeah, you you can... They, they save some... There's a couple of these where they do weird-ass programming tricks because they're just bored and, like, showcasing what they can do with the game when necessary. Mm -hmm. So once you get back to the title screen, once you press start, it gets you back in this room. I would be worried. It was funny. The other guy here is Dark Uchimichi. Yeah, this... Is a blooper guy. yeah. He says, don't shy away from the darkness. You must face it. Mwahaha. Pure darkness. Oh, how beautiful. Mwahaha. I think if you talk to him again, it says, don't shy away from darkness. You must face it. Mwahaha. Because I've got both those lines. Not there. true, dude. You can run from at least half your problems. Trust me. Also very true. The last person in here is Masataka Hata. Says, I'm responsible for the monster animation. To anyone who wins battles with ease. How about some monster watching by using the defend command? You might see a power move you've never seen before. But I won't take responsibility if you see the words game over by doing so. Take care. What's my man talking about here, Chris? Please defend a lot in the battle so you can see all my animations. Oh, I see. Yeah, because there's unique animations when they hit defend. I, I get it. And also give you the opportunity to see all the monster animations before you nuke them. Where to next? Top floor, right hallway. Okay, so Magical Troop is still playing. Hiroshi Uchiyami uh, is a tiger guy. He says, Rarg, rule number one about making games, keep on dreaming to find the right idea. Rule number two, work up a burning passion to make your idea into a reality. Rule number three, show love for your work. That's all, Rarg. It's fucking TED Talk, dude. Yeah, it's <laughs> it's pretty good advice, I guess. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of generic, like work hard and eat all your vegetables, kid. Yes. Who's our next guest of honor? It's Richard Richard Honeywood. We're on a first name basis with Richard by now. Yes. Unfortunately, Richard is not in, this, in the subject of our next game, but we will miss him dearly. The first thing he says is, who do you want me to impersonate? He him? uses his localization algorithm to perfection here. Yes. And then you can pick a number. Is that what is, is that the case? Yes. You can uh, pick between one and 43. Yes. These are the 43 different algorithmic patterns of speech, I guess. The number reflects the accent. Yes. So his dialogue, he says, I work at Square. In Tokyo, where I, quote, live with the Chrono Cross team, I was the localization director, the localization programmer, and one of the translators. One interesting feature of this game is its automatic accent generation ability. Without this system, all the text for the 43 main characters wouldn't have fit into the game, making an English version impossible. I created an English auto accent system where we could just write the plain translation and leave it up to the program to convert it in real time into the voice of wh whoever's speaking at the time. So, I am responsible for all those funny speech impediments that we've sure drove you crazy, but I bet you never realized they were auto-generated, right? Anyway, see you later, Serge. So I never saw him go on the record about this until that one-up interview in like 2005 or something like that. Yeah. So this was like all people had on as far as official word on that at the time. Yeah. I mean, we knew how it worked because yeah. people had kind of decoded the game on their own, but it was, I think this is the longest dialogue from anybody. And that's all I've yeah. got. I've got the right door in that hallway now. Okay. Marbule, another world plays. We first meet Yusuke Kigoshi. He says, Phew, looks like we finally made it. What kept me going was envisioning the expression on your face while you played the game. Did you enjoy it? And you can pick, Of course I did, or It was awesome. No matter what he says, really glad to hear that. Thank you for playing. I hope you're looking forward to our next project. Hmm. I wonder what this person went on to work on. Probably not another Chrono game. Fignet, what did Yusuke Kigoshi go to work on? Initializing Fignet. Yusuke Kigoshi went on to help create Final Fantasy XI and Final Fantasy XIV. Chris, who's next? Yoshitsugu Saito. The character model is Radius, and he puts his hands in the air and starts dancing when you speak to him. The magnificent story of the planet has ended, and a new journey unfolds. At the end of the eternal journey is... He says, anyway, there are so many sub-events in, sub in this game, you won't be able to see all of them the first time around. The course of action you take and the choices you make may reveal new events. Play the heck out of Chrono Cross. Cool, thanks, dude. Next is Hiroki Chiba. They say, hello, everybody. Just like in the original, I was in charge of the events for Chrono Cross. This time around, there were lots of characters. How many did you all get? It was a really difficult task for me to come up with that many events. But since all the characters had their own unique personality and style, it made my work a lot of fun. Who did you all like? My favorite is... A Secret. Ooh secrets 
We also have Noriko Mitose. Yep. This music seems so distant, yet so close. Garden of the Gods, please. From a dream long ago, they remind me of a season. How I was able to meet and accomplish something, I hope to meet again. A message I leave behind. Thank you. So Noriko really went hard at it. I was going to say, do yes. you think their coworkers are like, get a load of them taken seriously? Thank you, Noriko. Finally here, we have Mashihiro Kabe saying, thank you for playing Chrono Cross. Hope to see you again somewhere. Okay, what do we got next? Next room, in the room next to this, Termina Another World plays. Kiyoshi Sushia is here, and they say, I was in charge of the field map. I hope you enjoyed the world of Chrono Cross. Keep on playing to find all the hidden field maps, which I think means just like, when I hear field map, either they're talking about Divine Dragon Falls and uh, End of Time, Bend of Time. Forbidden Island too. Yeah. Or by like, find all the hidden maps, like all the backgrounds, I guess, I field guess. backgrounds. Hard to say. Noriko Saito is also here and says, well, I think I'll play again. This time I'm taking a different character along. Chrono Cross is so much fun. There are so many characters to choose from. It's like we're any better ad copy than that. Hire yeah. a real yeah. PR person. Sushigaru Aoki says, all right, Chrono Cross is complete. Good job, everyone. Good job to me too. It was really great working with the Chrono Cross team. Teamwork is a beautiful thing. I was also happy about the average age of the team members being so high. Born in 1967, I'm starting to worry about my waist size. All right. Thanks. Now we have Yoshiyuki Oku. I handled the battle animation sometimes. I worked really hard sometimes. I slept sometimes. I was frustrated sometimes. Well, I guess we're finished or not. Next time, I hope to improve the animation or not. In any case, I plan to live a lovely life for now. Finally, we have Takahashi Waku. They say many people come and go, which brings me to the following... As long as time and space is in accord with me, then everything is fine. This is what the other me is saying. That's how I felt about the project. I'm glad I was able to meet the other me. Wow, that's deep. That's deep, dude. <laughs> Thanks. Wow. I want to meet the other me, too. Me, too. Not me. Please help. Foyer, stairs, Sammy. Yep, Teddy and Sammy. Yeah, go ahead. Sammy, which is Shigeto Matushushima, says, Hi, I'm one of the localization specialists at Squaresoft who worked in the U.S. version of Chrono Cross. North American version, please, sir. First off, congratulations on clearing the game and finding this room. I hope you've enjoyed the world of Chrono Cross and its strange, <laughs> unique inhabitants. As our localization director, Richard, mentioned, this game would have not been possible without his auto-accent system. Having more than 40 main characters was a challenge to us, but it was hard to keep characterization consistent throughout the game. But overall, we managed to give each of them distinct characteristics without sacrificing consistency in the common lines. The same lines you saw when you played with one party combination will appear differently if you take different members of the same location. Try it out if you've enjoyed the game. Then your donation is to yours truly at P.O. Box. Just kidding. But seriously, please tell your friends about the game and invite them into the wonderful world of Chrono Cross. Thanks. 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 Great. The other person here is named Teddy. 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 Yukitaka Sano, who says, shake it, baby, irk it. And the text is all in different colors. My guy played Duke Nukem. Shake it, baby. Yeah, thanks for that, I guess. Now that's we're, all. That's all. We're going to the next lobby now? Basement foyer, yeah. Tomoko Murakami says, He, I really like him, that man with the goatee, dressed in black on a southern island. What? <laughs> He's too hairy. He's bald under that hat. He, he. That's what I like about him. What, what is he talking? What is this person talking about? I don't know. The that's our, the, that's the, our second goatee reference, though, too. The hair guy, maybe? I don't know. Who knows? Uh, Private fantasies. Thanks. Yochiro Hori. Is important to push when you can't pull. Shove a robot, push a robot. I guess so, yeah. And the other person I have here in the lobby is Kazuhiro Hasa, Hasagawa. There are many people in various places. You act differently towards many. You're always searching for yourself. What kind of you do you look like? And what kind of you do you want to be? I hope you find the right you. Good luck. This is according to specification. My guy's a robot, Chris. He's a plant. Mm. I don't have robots on your team in this game, by the way. A gro grobic? Grobic kind of. Yes, cyborg. cyborg. Cyborgs aren't robots. Don't even make that mistake sorry, ever again. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Human sorry. and sorry. cybernetic. Toru Osushita says, Dad, Mom, Grandma, Brother, Sister, Okachan, Kenji-san, Shin-chan, Gorota, Nori-chan, Man-chan, Shimano-chan, um, and everyone else. And to all of you who played Chrono Cross, I did it. Yeah, I did it. Thanks. Very Oscar speech. Yeah. Toru Oshita says, Dad, Mom, Grandma, Brother, Sister, Okachan, Kenji-san, Shin-chan. That's it. Yukiko Nakatani says, thanks for playing all the way through. Did you enjoy it? Anyone who's confused should play it again. Anyone who wants to know about the sequel, 
wait two more years. Just kidding. We're still waiting. Garota, Nanshan, Manshan, Shimano Chan, um, and everyone else, and all of you who played Chrono Cross, I did it. Yeah, I did it. Great. A lot of uh, sentimental stuff. Ryosuke Next. Aiba, right? That's all I've got for that room, but sure. Okay, I think this maybe is somebody else in the hallway or something. I made a lot of monsters. Over 100, actually. But because they're monsters, every one of them will be defeated. That's kind of sad, really. They didn't do anything wrong. Don't tell me you... Nah, you wouldn't do such a terrible thing. You didn't, did you? So thanks for making me feel bad about murdering all the monsters in this game. All right, wake back up, because now we're going to basement left door. Edge of death, place. Edge of death. Everyone here is a beach bum. We talked to Masanori Hoshino. He says, hello. I just started working as a planner. That's why I look like this. The one on the left is literally a battle at Lizard Beach. Gale plays, like we're taken to Lizard Beach. Yeah, we are having a fight now. Katsu Shisa Higuchi says, Hello people, I'm Katsu Shisa. I'm, I'm a programmer. Unlike the artists, musicians, and scenario writers, we programmers don't stand out that much, I guess. So today I thought I'd teach you folks just what a program is. Hold on while I call some of my friends. Hey, you guys. He does deluge and summons more monsters. Yeah, they come surfing in. Yeah. The fir- they're all beach bums, right? Yes. The first beach bum is Kazumi Kobayashi. He says, hi, I'm Kazumi. Nice to meet you. Katsushia Higuchi says, Kazumi programmed the sections that display maneuver polygon models. Why don't you show him, Kazumi? What happens? I don't know. A beach bomb attack surge. Oh, yeah. Higuchi then says, that was moving. Who's next? Then Yoshiyuki Mugiwawa comes in and says, I guess that's me. You may call me Maya. Higuchi says, Maya wrote the program sections that manipulate effects. His effects look like this. It then transitions to a bunch of different battle scenes. Hydra Marshes, Earth Dragon Isle, and then winds up under the El Nido Triangle. Higuchi then says, mighty effective, don't you think? And last but not least we have, and then Kohi Ono says, Oh no! Oh no! Oh no! I'm not in trouble, that's that's my name. <laughs> uh, nice little... Uh, yeah. Higuchi says, the special effects used in battles, as well as the menu systems program. Go for it, Ono. And then a hand is traced on the ground, then it rises out of the ground and clenches into a fist. Yeah, this is how handy. How does uh, Do we ever see any effects like this in the game? No, this is think. like some custom shit they did yeah. on like the non-existent breaks. Yeah. It then pounds Surge into wave effects. He says this is handy. Smash Brothers Master Hand confirmed for <laughs> yes. Cross. Thanks. It's connection. Higuchi says, oh, and it's for me? Well, I was responsible for the overall battle program. Why well, I even wrote the data and functions that allow this image of me to talk to you like this. The artificial intelligence and logic of the monsters and other enemies was also written by yours truly. Thanks for listening to my long speech here. Oh, and I really appreciate that you bought a copy of Chrono Cross, too. Well, till we meet again in some other game, take care and sayonara. This was kind of neat because they're kind of, like, I mean, most people aren't video game development literate at yeah. all, but especially back then. And this is a nice little bit that would uh, give you a little bit of insight into that. Also, it's goofy as hell. Yes. Also in this room, when well, you go back to the room... Tetsunobu Sonoda. It says, push Mura Pura, push Mura Mura, push, push. Seem a little more pushy. No, not at all. Yeah, great. And then there's Koji Ono, who we just met. They say, I was in charge of programming in the menu effects. I hope you enjoyed it. Boy, it sure was tough dealing with odd and even numbers, huh? The flickering? Oh, it's supposed to be that way. The best I can figure out is there's a small flicker when it switches from 240p to 480i when you go to the menus. Oh, maybe so. I don't know. That's oh. the best I can do. Yeah, with I couldn't that. figure that either. Yoshiyuki Miyagawa says, I program the visual effects. Due to the magnificent work of designers, the quality was surprisingly excellent. I hope my programs will really add to the game so that you may further indulge in the world of Chrono Cross. I hope you feel your time playing this game was well spent. Please enjoy the extra features the second time around. And there's a red dragon in the back corner. You talk to them and it prompts a battle as Gale plays. We're in Black Dragon Cave. Yeah, this is wild. The Black Dragon and a skeleton pirate. They're fighting each other. Yeah. Skeletons versus dragons, pirates versus ninja. The dragon beats the shit out of Toshiaki Suzuki, and we go back to the post-battle screen. Yep. And that's it. Yeah, that's all that happens. That's, they just wanted to mess with us, I guess. Left room, left basement hallway. Field of time, homeworld plays. Kyoji Uma Koshi says, there's someone really scary in the sound room. I'd better make a run for it. Yoshitaka Hirota says, I'm so busy, busy. I want to take off somewhere far away on my bike. Me too. Yes, always. Yes. Chiharu Minikawa says, women must be strong and live vigorously. Are you strong? Are you strong, id? This is id. Yes, of course. Yashihiro Yamamoto says, I love Pip. That thing's so cute. Thank you. Uh, Ryo Yamazaki says, well, what do you think? Great sound, eh? Watch for us on the PS2. Chris, I looked him up. 
Yeah. My guy worked as a synth programmer on Final Fantasy X, Unlimited Saga, Dirge of Cerberus, and more recently, the upcoming Balan Wonderworld. Oh, cool. <laughs> which looks like shit. Yeah, I heard that it wasn't getting well received. Sorry, Eric. I thought it looked pretty cool. I, I, I'm going to play it. I like Knights. Also, somebody that we've heard of is in here. His name, Yasunori Mitsuda. Yeah. Mitsuda says, how did you like the music? Hmm. What should I do next time? Anyway, I'm off on another trip. Oh, yeah. The soundtrack should be out by then, so be sure to go out and buy it. See ya. The last person here is Ryu Inakura. Call me funky. I bought a new pair of jeans because my other ones have holes. What do you think? Thanks, I guess. I thought we had to talk to Mitsuda back here. Right basement hallway, right door. Music. Goldove. Another world plays. Yoshihiro Takashida is here. They say, good job making it this far. Ah, uh, I see. Yes, yes. Sounds like you had quite an adventure. It brings a tear to my eye. I have a small present for you. Pick one. Green light, blue light. Thanks. You pick You pick one and it just changes the... It changes the whole screen, that color. Yeah, which... I love shit like that. Sure, great. Uh, also in here is Takuji Anai. It says, I drew the world map. I really worked my heart out, so it'd be great if you could play the game a number of times. Thank you. Sure, I'll make a podcast about it too, buddy. Listen Thanks. to it a number of times, please. Yes. Yusuke Hone says, who's a dancing dwarf, yeah. says, I went all out on the art. Phew. Momentum is a powerful thing. How about it, everyone? A long vacation? I guess not. Yeah, I think uh, Yasuki Hone also worked on Xenogears. Yeah, that sounds right. Yeah, yeah. Yoshimasa Furukawa says, burn it, freeze it, fly it. Okay, I will do so. Also in here is Mizushi Sugawara says, to all you item collectors out there, were you able to get them all? I'll be doing my best. Sure, I guess. I've got uh, DJ Demi next. Yeah, DJ Demi. What the fuck? <laughs> it says, which song should I play? Please enter a number. You enter a number and it's a soundtrack. It's hot sounds. DJ yeah. Demi is Franz. Yes, confirmed. The pink one next to him will also play a different song. I think they're divided. Like the full soundtrack is probably divided in two menus. Yeah. The left side of the wall, there's a kid and it says, huh? What the? You have a problem? It ain't like I'm looking for someone to pickpocket or looking for some loose change. <laughs> Fine. Here's a special treat. I'll change the characters' names for you. Whose names do you want to change? That's weird, right? Yeah, it's like a secret in a secret. Yeah. Again, there's speculation. We'll get to it later. This was a debug room they just repurposed. Oh, yeah. That makes sense. Finally, right basement hallway, left door. Music, Goldove, Homeworld plays. Takashi Kimura? Yep. They say, from the depths of the dark ocean bottom, gazing up at the bright world so far. What exists there? What will you find? <laughs> just kidding. That's out of character. Takato Ito says, it would make me so happy knowing that you enjoyed the game. So much that you lost track of time. No, really. Yoshinori Ugara says, so sleepy. Thanks. Uh, Ryo Surumaki says, hello, I was in charge of creating the field map ID data and mask processing. It's like the masking they have over the the background, like where they put like the doves and the what and the, um, or I'm sorry, the, pi the pigeons. Like and it's water. a mesh that they blend together. Yeah, like I the, guess. The, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, if you ever run into problems like it's so hard to get around on this map or the character's clipping the chair, it's my fault. <coughs> it's a feature, huh? ID data, mass processing. Oh, I hope to see you again somewhere. That's funny. It's not a bug. It's a feature. Yes, thanks. And finally, as Starkey, we have Masoto Kato. Yeah. And before you, you read this, I, this makes this I think this almost confirms that like Starkey was the brainchild of Kato. Like he had to have yeah. Starkey in the game. Like he, he needed to work this little dumb, dumbass alien in the you game. You can read a bunch into that. Yeah. Another exciting nightmare is about to end. <laughs> what kind of love and dream await you around the next corner? Have faith in tomorrow and live it your way. Is Good this, luck. Is this Kato like expressing that th this entire project was a nightmare and he's glad it's over, but also so. trying to talk himself at, yeah. you know, talk himself up into the next thing? Because mm -hmm. uh, what did he do next after this? Where did he move on to? I guess we don't have that in front of us. Fake net. Uh, Chris look. net. Initializing Chris net. <laughs> it's interesting because the next thing that he's credited for as a director or designer is another Eden 2019 God like after that he went full in as a as a writer or a uh, scenario uh, director that's a, another Eden is a mobile free to play thing right yeah yeah is it, it like a gotcha thing it is and it has like I think Mitsuda did the music for it as well and Great. It, it has like a frog with a sword in it like they went hard on like stuff that they yeah that they were into um, the only thing that I can remember that he worked on he did the story for Ninja Gaiden 3 Razor's Edge in 2013. Good lord. Yeah, I'm yeah. Well, he worked on the Why? I mean, well, because he he wrote the original stories for Ninja Gaiden 2 The Dark Sword of Chaos and The Ancient Ship of Doom for NES. Oh, I didn't know that. Okay. Yeah, yeah he worked on those. So the next thing he's credited for for Square is he worked on Final Fantasy 
11 online as the plot slash events supervisor. A lot of people went to 11 yeah. as their PS2 like project. Yeah. Uh, also as a writer, he worked on Biting Kaibos, Eternal Wings, and the Lost Ocean. As That's back with... Um, it's, a, it's a monolith game. Yeah it's a, mo- yeah, it's a monolith game. Maybe he's a contractor at this point in time. He did the Children of Mana uh, original story, which was 2006. It's which the DS th- Mana game. I think that was the DS Mana game. Dawn of Mana is the PS2 game. Yeah. He also worked on Heroes of Mana, which I'm not sure what that is. That might have been a mobile thing. Oh, no, that was that was DS as well. And he worked on Sands of Destruction. Sands of Destruction has a Matsuda soundtrack. It is a Sega published game for DS that is prohibitively expensive now. I always wanted to play it. Yeah. So, I mean, this guy still had a, a relatively prolific career, but as we mentioned, like a lot of the failings of the of, of his direction in this game, maybe either taught him a lesson that this was a, you know, this is a nightmare, not what he wanted to do, or <laughs> kind of like, you know, he kind of got uh, out of the Squaresoft canon for people who are given new projects to. You always wonder if he even wrote like a treatment for his sequel. Yeah. Because you, you Suzuki apparently made a Saturn version of Virtua Fighter 3, which is legendary among Virtua Fighter fans that like they're scant trace of it ever existing some people saw it it's like a big rumor in the community for 20 years and shit like this like when you ask suzuki about it he's like i don't know we probably did who can say right like this pivotal thing people hang their hats on they don't even remember doing wow so that that thing where like geniuses forget more than more than you'll ever know about a subject yeah yeah so interesting so if you ask kato for like a follow-up to chrono cross he's like i don't know i probably wrote one yeah i mean isn't the i think he said at at times that he wrote radical dreamers just because he wanted to tie up the loose ends and then kind of you know, I, I guess unfinished kind of, business kind of fell into, into Chrono Cross. So there's actually one more thing here. It's a door at the end and would have been the trap cage and it's completely locked. Hasegawa says, there are many people in various places. You act differently towards many. You're searching for yourself. What kind of you do you like and what kind of you do you want to be? I hope you find the right you. Good luck to you. This is all according to specification. So this door behind there has its entire fact at Game Facts written in 2001 by Zelda Dude. And it's a fascinating slice of the internet when rumors and mysteries were still possible. A time before people decompiled the game's source code and two days before it came out. Yeah. And like, there were rumors at the time that back there is how you get Chrono on your team. That's the character (laughs) model. I've heard that one. Yeah, like this guy's fact has like all the rumors about it, like debunked and like people thought at the time. It's like a really interesting slice of history that I found while poking around at Game Facts. I recommend you go read that for like just the era of the internet where you shit was not solved. Yeah. Wow. It's a fun thing to be like, because they were finding people who were credited in the game, but like were in this area. So they were tucked back there. But really, they think it was a debug room that was just locked out once the game shipped. Like a further debug room. Chrono Cross, it's over. I mean, I guess last episode was our kind of complete wrap up of that. So, But this was like a nice epilogue. Yeah, yeah, for of sure. Course. This game being unique and having a plethora of alternate scenarios to go through. Let's consult the real net. Initializing real net. For the last time in a Chrono Cross podcast. For season least. two. For season two. A Carfo says, I don't like the idea of the old fake nut having no memories of the new fake nut, LOL. Uh, the old fake net knows about the new fake net. The new fake net does not know about the old fake net. Stay tuned. I still draw breath. Papa I'm John undecided whether there's going to be a third fake net yet. I awfully like the second one. Yeah, me too. I love you too. Carfo also says the fast forward feature in New Game Plus is really cool. I think... I remember reading that they technically did it by just cutting the frames. Yes, that's all it does. Yeah. I mean, that's what Fast Forward essentially does with music and video, too, is it just drops like every third frame or some shit. Yeah. John Doe says, maybe the two fake nets don't have memories of one another because they're parallel timeline versions of one another. God damn it, that's good. I wish I would have thought of that. Yeah. There are two of us. May we learn to embrace the duality. It's in the world that time forgot, like the yeah. time reset. <laughs> Brandon says, I know I watched all the Chrono Cross endings back in the day, but I have no memory of any of them except for General Kid for some reason. Yeah, I don't think I, I, don't think I experienced any of them first. Yeah, this is myself. probably the first time that I've ever seen them, honestly. John Doe says, wonder if Norris was also the mystery person anonymously doing good deeds who that little girl assumed was Korcha. Yeah, it, we saw that. It yeah. was, um, it was uh, one of the um, doodle suit kids. Oh, okay, yeah. SSDN just says, bless these endings. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're pretty good. I think the, the the Chrono Trigger ones are, are much better. The, these do a pretty good job. I, I just wish they could have explored the alternate timeline stuff a little bit more in depth. You wish they had new time. And like, you can tell they weren't a priority because there's nothing new here. It's all reused assets. Yeah. I mean, we should be able to play Chrono. I mean, we should be able to play Radical Dreamers in this game. Yeah. That'd be there awesome. There should be, if you just cut out to that, that'd yeah. be great. Like in the, in the Chrono Trigger well, sort of engine. a lot like... 
in the re-release of Chrono Trigger on DS, Radical Dreamers wanted to be in that, but Kato apparently was not comfortable with it being part of it because of its, quote, unfinished nature and like it being non-canon and I think being slightly embarrassed of his older work. Yeah, yeah. So it was discussed, but ultimately decided not to. Yeah. Carfo says regarding Harley, you can take the dragon out of the game, but you can't take the game out of the dragon. That's right. Yeah, in, in, in reference to Harley uh, leading Lynx into a uh, domestic life in Marbule. Change your clothes, dude. Don't wear the Corsair outfit. Vod W says, I wonder who the voice actor behind the original fake net line is up to these days. I don't think we could ever find the name of that person. I think that was just an, an additional voices person. Oh, yeah. Jeez. Yeah, I don't think so. We could interview them. Yeah, if we could, if we could get her, or like, that would just be to say stuff. Oh for man, us. I, I would could, put all the Patreon money to it. <laughs> Wouldn't be enough though. I, yeah, yeah. I don't know. I mean, it's not hard to get in touch with people who know Richard Honeywood. Yeah. <laughs> so, but as far as casting directors from twenty two, I don't know. I don't know. John Doe says the idea of kid just never noticing that Surge can suddenly talk is really funny to me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, it is funny from our perspective, but I think the implication was is that he's talking, but we... But, We're selecting, but, yeah. Yeah, we don't get to see him. SCN just says, A-D-A-B, all dragoons are bad. A bastard, excuse me. Carfo says, I wonder if these endings were penned by the same person or a select few, or if the team just open sourced it and let everyone on their team submit ideas and they went with it. I do wonder that if it's like the Radical Dreamers thing where like they was divvied out to like people who hadn't, could, yeah. were on the main scenario. I think Kato mentioned that he divvied out a lot of the... Uh, you know, the, the character subplots and stuff like that. So that's probably the case because I think there was a lot of delegation in this uh, in this game's development. John Doe says, the Vipler youth. <laughs> Vipler. John Doe says, this is in reference to uh, the, the bar ending. Oh my God, it's the fucking host club grift from Yakuza. Yep. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Good on Chris for reading into that because that went over my head completely. John Doe says, shout out to the creature designer. Dude, put in some work. Yeah, we've uh, noted Absolutely. often this game has a tier monster design. This game has some of my favorite textures on the PS1. Yeah. They had really figured it out at this point. John Doe says, why are there so many characters signed? Someone, everyone else in the staff should have listened to. You know what? I was thinking about it just now. What is a place we only went to really once in this game that was never, the music was rarely reused and the backgrounds were never reused? There was no other plot reason to go there other than Cape Howell. Yeah, Cape Hell's the only one with Lizard no. Beach. Yeah, that's true. Like we never the music. It was just weird how like everything else got double utilized in Lizard Beach. You do have to go through it the first time in each world, though. Yes, uh, but like the monster, there's never the monsters are different, and it kind of get, it leads you into the idea that, that things have changed. But there's, yeah, but there's but never like, any. Specific, unlike Isle of the Dead yeah. or Hydra Marshes, Shadow Forest, even you went to all these places multiple times. Yeah, I did not did not know this. Controller Freak says they did the reset trick in Chrono Trigger as well. So I was expecting it this time around, but they sold it really well and I actually believed it this time. I, I don't remember that. I don't know if I've ever seen all the Chrono Trigger endings. The first time I had seen a, a game punch the fourth wall like that was Metal Gear Solid. Yeah, same here. Vot W says, I remember when I ran into Richard. Not literally. <laughs> I, I didn't realize it was all algorithmic. I tried to make my own plug-in for AOL Instant Messenger. <laughs> Shit, dude. Oh, man. <laughs> Anonymous says, I know Noriko Matose from, I don't know what any of this, these words are. Uh, she's one of the star singers, a.k.a. sings for one of the, I don't know what this is, t t Tonalico, AR Tonalico. Those are PS2 games. Oh, okay. PS3 games as well. I think they're oh. um, Nipponichi Strategy. I don't remember what oh. exactly. I, I didn't know that. Well, apparently that uh, is, she's one of, the, one of the singers in that game. SSCN just says, old fake net, best fake net. Bless this mess. It was more gentle, more calm. More disappointed in us when we messed up. The Chrono Cross series is over. Thank you, everybody, for joining us for yet another long and arduous season. Although this one was not as long as the last one. The other one went 15 weeks longer, Eric. Will anything ever top Xenogears with the 55 episodes? I don't think so. Yak is a zero. <laughs> Maybe. So we are going to return in an X amount of weeks with a third season of this podcast. The game is going to be, Eric... Final Fantasy VIII. And Eric, since you weren't here with me on the night that we revealed this, what are your initial thoughts about doing a podcast on Final Fantasy VIII? Very much looking forward to it, Chris. Thanks. <laughs> Appreciate that. I mean, I, I wrote a 2,000-word retrospective on VIII less than a year ago, so I could go through all of that again. Like, I, I'm looking not looking forward to accidentally spreading Tetra, uh, Tetra, Tetra Triad. 
the bad rules for the card game yeah. and getting shit fucked up across universes. I'm not looking to sitting like to enjoy sitting there drawing and stalking forever, but I am looking to manipulate the battle system in my favor and just really indulging in that world over again. I think eight is the most magical Final Fantasy. Really interesting. Like in the futuristic setting and how it was considered heresy at the time, separated years from that where that's basically normal now. And that and then like I think you referenced what happens to Odin is some yeah. of the most fucked shit in the entire series. As I've started to prepare for the next podcast, I am beginning to realize how much I don't remember at all about that game. So I'm looking forward into dissecting some of the weirdness of that game. I saw a screenshot the other day of like a squall hanging on a rope with a punch kick block command with another soldier where you had to do some sort of timing yeah. uh-huh. button. Pre- I was like, I don't remember Dude, anything about that. That so. game has quizzes for money. Okay, great. Well, that's it, Eric. Thanks for another great season. This episode is a production of Retrograde Amnesia, recorded on February 19th, 2021. Thank you, Mark. Shepard. For the music. You're welcome, Chris. Find us on Twitter at Retro Amnesia Pod, and if you like us, please consider supporting us on Patreon at patreon.com slash retro am. Get yourself some early access, bonus episodes, miniseries, voting rights, stereo mix, and access to the real net on Discord. Email us at retrogradmediapodcast at gmail.com. Eric, until next time. Yes, we will kill time compression. (laughs) And now you may go back to sleep. There's a lot of hustle and bustle outside today, and he wonders if something is going on. But he doesn't know because he's been doing mushrooms. (laughs) I just squeefed. I'm sorry. You might want to say that again. Um, and as we've seen in our uh, previous podcast, uh, mini-series, TerraNigma.com slash Retro AM. No, no. TerraNigma.com. <laughs> Harley says, uh, oh, it's French. Which means what in French? Which means what in French, Chris? I fucking wrote it here. SSDN just says, always do three. Chrono Cross. The Chrono Cross pon- p- Ponus Pod p- Ponus. That's it. Let's read the outro. Will it not be next week? You said it any number of weeks. I assume it's probably going to be next okay. week because we're going to be caught up, but it'll be out next week, I'm sure. We don't miss weeks around here. We haven't met, we've done, we got two whole seasons out without missing a fucking single week. If you miss a week, you just put in like episode five of Perfect Works. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Here, take this. If we ever have to take a week off, which we shouldn't given our progress. Hey, Eric. Hey, Eric. Isn't it automated? What are we doing? Hey, Eric. No, I said I'm still going to say hey, Eric. Shepherd. 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 Shepher